It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We've got a great panel for you. Paris Martineau is here from the information. She's so smart. Lou Maresca is here from This Week in Enterprise Tech and Microsoft. And from rstreet.org, it's our token conservative. She's just a little right of center. Shoshana Weissman, lots to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about the NSA lobbying Congress to let the, let the NSA buy information about your location. Uh, Elon Musk's big lit up X, YouTube, and Facebook, big quarters for both. Facebook crosses 3 billion users, or is it 3 billion grandparents? And then we're going to talk about the app CEOs love to hate. It's all coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 938, recorded Sunday, July 30th, 2023. Shifting the Ovaltine window. This episode of This Week in Tech is brought to you by ACI Learning. IT skills are outdated in about 18 months. Launch or advance your career today with quality, affordable, entertaining training. Individuals, use the code TWIT30 for 30% off a standard or premium individual IT pro membership at go.acilearning.com slash TWIT. And by ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, you're currently dealing with a slowing economy, which adds to your challenges. Thankfully, there's a hiring partner who's focused on you and your needs. ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. ZipRecruiter. Try it free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Twit. This Week in Tech, the show we cover the week's tech news. We, I have to say, we've been having a little fun before the show. Uh, and if you are a Club Twit member, you'll want to check out the Twit Plus feed for AI Johnny Cash, if nothing else. Joining us now from Avenue R, or R Street, uh, in Washington, D.C. She lives in a pineapple under D.C., Shoshana Weissman, head of digital Thank media, rstreet.org. And, uh, of course, the Sloth Committee is still going, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're doing well. <laughs> Slowly. Senator Shoshana. Yeah. Uh, now I don't know what to do. I guess I have to say on X. Which doesn't come you off don't. right. You don't have to say Shoshana's on X. on X. Um gosh, Paris Martineau, you don't you don't you're not you're not Paris Martineau on X? I'm not. I can't get behind it. No. It feels wrong. But what do we it call it? Wrong. The app formerly known as Twitter. The app formerly known as Twitter. We call it Twitter. Twitter. In the same way that we refer to Google as Google, even though it's technically alphabet. part of Alphabet. And you call Facebook. I think we can do this. Yeah. I don't know why we've decided not to do that for Facebook and we're calling it Meta, but I think we can do it for X. X just sounds so dumb. Paris writes about the company formerly known as Amazon on The Information. Wonderful. True. Pu wonderful publication. Also with us from our very own This Week in Enterprise Tech, he is a code, a self-described code monkey at Microsoft. Hello, Hi. Lou Maresca. Hey, Leo. Great to see you. It is wonderful to see you. And is at Lou MM on X as well? I think it is. We're all on X today. I'm not on, on X. X. I got off X years ago. Actually, I of oh, all you're the, you're an XX. I'm an or? Xer. XXer. <laughs> uh, of all people, I'm the happiest about the name change because I've been f fighting with Twitter over the name because we're Twit and we predated Twitter. I remember asking Elf, Ev Williams in the early days of of Twitter. Why did you name it Twitter? You knew there was Twitter. He his first, his company before Twitter was Odeo, which was a podcasting uh, platform. And we were one of the biggest podcasts on it. So I knew he knew who Twitter is. He said, I didn't think either of us were going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't really matter, but uh, Twitter obviously did. And, uh, you know, we've, we've. And the title of Chief Twit in particular. Oh, I was so really mad when Elon. Come a full circle. I've been for you. Chief Twit for 15 years. Anyway, Elon is no longer Chief Twit. He's Chief X, which, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. honestly, I feel like we won. Like, Ev, see, we outlasted Twitter. So there. That's true. Yeah. yeah. 
So I'm actually very you happy. You could launch a platform called Twitter now. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I'll be selling oh, actually, the brand that's name interesting. at some point. I don't need to buy it. I have the trademark for Twit. I wonder you if could, I could though. do could that. It could be fun. Then you could yeah. turn it into a microblogging platform. <laughs> we had an unofficial, you know, gentleman's agreement with Twitter back in the day that uh, we wouldn't do microblogging, kind of like uh, the Beatles and uh, Apple. Uh, we wouldn't do microblogging, and they wouldn't uh, do uh, podcasts. But they 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 launch spaces. They have a lot of podcasts on the network. They've got, you know, what's his name from uh, Fox on there doing I, what is effectively a, a podcast. Um, I think it's technically a vodcast. There's a, a whole video element. Well, what are we doing? We're vodcasting, right? Yeah, and, this is definitely a vodcast. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we kissed and made up. It's involved a small check. But other than that, everything is <laughs> everything is fine. And I'm just really pleased now that Elon has seen the light and rebranded. Uh, have you seen, speaking of seeing the light, and I'm, I'm not, I think I can't play this without warning people uh, if you're sensitive to strobes and flashing lights, uh, you should you should turn away. Elon has put a giant uh, X sign above Twitter headquarters. See, Leo, that's the sort of disclosure that would be nice for any of the people living in the surrounding area, well, that's, Twitter's <laughs> offices that's and Market the, Street. That's the sad thing. So here it is being erected, and I'm sure Elon likes that word because... <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. And it really doesn't. It looks pretty janky. Uh, I don't know what those poles are, but the city. Apparently there's a lot of sandbags up there. It, yeah. Don't you get that feeling? Yeah. Uh, the city of San Francisco has already uh, said that's against permit. You you got to take it down. Yeah. But the city of San Francisco has been saying that everything Twitter or X has been doing is against permit since Elon Musk took over and started turning conference rooms into hotel suites company and installing, uh, yeah, yeah, the company formerly known as Twitter, installing f like fire safety code violation locks. It, they've been breaking the rules since the beginning and he just seems to keep getting away with it like he does with everything. It, it, his, it's clear that his attitude is do it and ask, you know, ask, it's better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. Right. I don't think he's even asking for forgiveness. <laughs> I think his uh, mode is just do it. Yeah. He had, the video that he posted did not flash. It's just blinking slowly. But I've seen many, many subsequent videos of it strobing. Uh, and the neighbor and seeing buildings across the way just brightly lit. But this thing is very, very bright. Uh, it was turned off last night, apparently. So maybe he is listening <laughs> or forced to listen. Apple has just, said that you can't make an app with one letter. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't know that. You didn't really plan it all that well. You get the feeling. Um. <laughs> well, I mean, this has been a kind of through line since the PayPal days, where I'm I might be remembering this incorrectly, but I think I'm right. He had bought X dot com. Um, way back when originally for a couple million dollars and really angled hard for them to rebrand PayPal as X, despite all of the focus groups and testing being like, people don't like the name X. It reminds them of porn. We can't do X. People are using PayPal as a verb. Why don't we just stick with what we've got? But since the beginning, he has been dead set on doing X for everything, no matter the cost, which is just baffling to me. He bought it in uh, 1999, so he's owned X.com since then. Indonesia banned X.com because uh, it, they thought it was a porn site. I don't know if they fixed that, but Twitter was blocked in Indonesia for a while. Uh, but you're right. Even when he was uh, 28 in 1998, uh, Musk wanted to do the everything uh, uh, thing app that would do all your banking, all your investments, all your money like would go through this. Yeah, like WeChat yeah. does in China. Um and he's, he's even said when he bought Twitter, he said that's what the future of Twitter was. So I guess it shouldn't be a surprise that we rebranded it X. Throwing away, though, do you think he's throwing away a valuable brand, Lou? I mean, Twitter's been Absolutely. around since 2006. It's pretty well known. You think about it, there's not been a lot history-wise. There's not been a lot of companies that have been able to rebrand themselves successfully without losing a bunch of things. I mean, there's some out there. That have changed their, you know, their view yeah, even, points on things. Even Alphabet still calls the search Google. 
Right. They didn't right. call it I mean, the alphabet search. Right. I mean, there have been some that I would say that in history, like I remember Google when it first started out, they were called something something real strange, like back rub or something like that. I can't remember what it was, but it was they changed themselves really it was fast. Rub, I think wasn't it? it? Yeah. I something think you like that. It right. Yeah. 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 And so I think they, you know, they did it really quickly before they became popular. But I'd say after that, a lot of companies, they might change their images like GoDaddy or something like that, but they never really changed their names. So I, I'm, I'm curious to see if this is going to be successful or not. The Economic Times says Google was called Backrub and Pepsi-Cola was originally, oh, I, can't, I just, it just blocked me. <laughs> Pepsi-Cola was originally named Brad's Drink. So, okay, I think we should bring back Brad's drink. <laughs> That's great. That is the that is. If I saw something called Brad's drink at the store, I would buy it. No further questions. Well, if it's good enough for Brad, uh, it's good enough for me. Why Nike. Not? Nike was originally Blue Ribbon Sports. Right. Amazon was early going to be Cadabra, something that uh, Bezos had picked out from the dictionary, and then uh, Relentless. I believe if you still type in relentless.com, it redirects to Amazon to this day. And that was his kind of uh, philosophy is to be relentless. Let's try it. Relentless.com. Yep. yep. Pulls right up. There we go. Wow. Pick up where you left off. You can get some dumbbells, Leo. You could do some, <laughs> could do some little weightlifting. Oh, I am so uh, chagrined. Recording. I am so ashamed. <laughs> Uh, I was, <laughs> I apologize. I was looking for some dumbbells because I want to hey, pump me up. Hey, those will match your outfit so you can take them to Barbie <laughs> when you go see them. These, these dumbbells weigh 0 0.01 kilograms. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like a two ounces. Breeze. They're not very, they're not very, but they're just right for me. And hey, pink is my color. <laughs> these are, it's yeah, true. yeah. I just thought, I well, believe in you. To do a little more, just a little, little more. A little more? You going to push me? Are you going to be my just trainer, Shoshana? Yes, Say, I'll be your trainer. One more rep. Oh, <laughs> I, I can't. Ooh. Uh, so what is the? What are the odds that Elon will make Twitter into the everything company? Can he? WeChat is a good example. I mean, it, it, it is dominant in China. I'm sorry. What is the? Are you asking that he is actually successful in making <laughs> it into an everything company, or that he tries? Because those are two very different questions. To do this with, a, with a straight face. I mean, clearly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> clearly, there's some roadblocks. Uh, first of all, I mean, the most obvious one is: Would you trust him with your money? Not in he, a million years. <laughs> he keeps like stealing, like not letting people cancel their memberships, right? Like yeah. imagine just like throwing all your data and bank information and investments at the guy who can't like be trusted to have you cancel an $8 a month subscription. <laughs> I was very nervous when I bought a Model X and this is before all this because Elon had famously canceled model somebody's what? Model Elon? Uh, no, model the Model X. X. I had a Model Sorry. X Tesla. I did. Uh, very famously, there was a, some, a blogger, I think, who said something bad about Tesla, and Elon canceled his Model X reservation. So I'm, I have this reservation. I really wanted this car back in 2014 or 15. And uh, and I realized that I was in the, I was at mercy of Elon Musk. If I said something bad about Tesla, he could cancel it. So well, it's good because you've never done that, you know. You only I love speak, Elon. I just you only love, talk about how much you love Elon and revere is him. So, so great. There mm -hmm. are you go to Twitter. There you say anything negative about Elon, and and there are lots of blue checks who will brigade you. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Why are it's you really still funny. on Twitter then, Shoshana? What or X? Why? It's just for work, honestly. Just the, the people I want to reach are still sort of there for now. So figure reporters and people who work in House and Senate, um, those are a lot of my big audience. So while they're there, I'll be there. But I don't really, like the platform is increasingly sucking and being a pain. And we're cutting back already a lot of our engagement there just because it's not worth the ROI anymore. Yeah. Uh, I do notice a lot of members of Congress, mostly the left, have moved to Meta's uh uh, you know, platform. I always want to say glances. Wait, I, don't I know have why. Um, What's it called? I forgot. Bots for, for, threads. Threads. That's the name of it. Are you guys on Threads? Are yeah. you using Threads? Well, uh, the story is 100 million people joined it in the first week, and 50 million left the second week. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, engagement is down 70%. I feel like that. It's like means. threads, from my perspective, I think threads only exists for people who already have large Instagram followings to repost threads uh, to their Instagram stories. Yeah. I, but I also don't really use threads because for me, at least the, um, the people, the, my social media profiles on Twitter and Instagram could not be more different. <laughs> my Instagram is private for a reason and I like to use it to interact with people I actually know. And my Twitter is for shit posts and work related stuff. And those two audiences should not mix. But I think that's, I, I'm curious, have you guys been enjoying threads? I have initially because it was, it was the, all the people I followed on Twitter had moved over. And so it was very much like my old Twitter was with, you know, without mm -hmm. the Elon, the dash of Elon that has been thrown in. Um, but at the same time, I had misgivings. We talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I had Dan Patterson on who's done a lot of work in countries uh, where Facebook has been appalling in its willingness to support dictatorships and its unwillingness to take down um, genocidal posts, things like that, uh, with the Rohingya, with Myanmar. And so he he practically bust a, busted a gasket when he said, but you can't support Meta. And I've, I've had, heard other people say that too. And I say, well, do you have Instagram? Well, yeah, but I don't have a Facebook account. Do you have WhatsApp? Well, yeah, but I don't have a Facebook account. It's all Meta and it's all the same. Um, and they're all connected. And they're all and connected. The and I do have an Instagram account only, mostly because on the show, if I want to show somebody's Instagram, uh, I have to be logged in to see, you know, all the posts. So I keep it for that reason. I don't really post there. And I and I use WhatsApp when I'm out of the country and I need to communicate with people who aren't in the U.S. Most of them use WhatsApp. So I guess it's kind of like you. I stay on, I'm, I don't use Twitter, but we do as a company because that's, you know, you still have to have some sort of presence there, I guess. I think that's starting to go away though. I've been like, our engagement has just totally dropped. So uh, we do a lot of just re-upping old posts that are relevant, just policy stuff that's still going on. But I've stopped doing that. Like what's scheduled is scheduled, but beyond that, I'm not doing any more because our posts aren't getting much engagement. It's not the same level of like, oh, I saw your tweet. Therefore, I wanted to meet with you stuff. So now we're kind of moving strangely enough to LinkedIn, which I want LinkedIn to do a little bit more because I think there's a lot of potential that they're not tapping sometimes. And uh, email, a lot of email. Yeah. LinkedIn for our street seems like a perfect place. to Yeah. Be. Now, let me, I don't, let me not pigeonhole you. But I get, I always get the sense when I look at rstreet.org, it's a, it's a, a think tank, but I also notice it says free market. So I get the sense it is maybe somewhat right of center. It's not, it's not. Oh yeah. So we're right of center, but our staff are all over the spectrum, which I really like. Like, it's funny. A lot of our editorial team leans very left, which is super helpful because then if they're editing our stuff, they can be like, hold on, you don't know how this comes across and then give us feedback and think like, okay, think through this again. This way you upset nobody rather than upsetting some people on the left because I know you don't mean it to sound like that. So it's nice that we have people across the spectrum, but we definitely lean right. We're like center right. I, you know, I always think of you as somewhat like the magazine Reason, which is a libertarian yeah. publication where it's not dogmatic. It's not, an, it's not ideological. It's not a think tank. There are like the Heritage uh, Society or whatever, uh, dogmatic ideological think tanks. You're not one of those. Um, so I was always, I read your stuff because I do feel like it's, it's kind of, it's good to see another point of view on it. And it's fair. It's there. It's thought out. It's not. Like, uh, you know, right makes might fascism. Thank you. <laughs> but I No, I really appreciate that. No, it's true. But at the same time, you might say if you're right of center, the Twitter or pardon me, X. <laughs> I can't do it. Twitter might be. A good, <laughs> it might be a good home. Uh, you'd be more likely to find uh, people who agree with you on 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 Twitter, which has definitely moved to the right. I mean, the people thriving, though, it's not just right of center. It's like nuts right of center. It's not like, oh, I think we should have mildly smaller government and think through this. It's like just MAGA, like right. all these weird right. bad stuff. It's And we're not that, which is like, we'll work with people who are if we can get good stuff done. But we're pretty we're pretty like middle of the road, but we lean right. So 
we liked it when there was kind of everyone involved because then we could reach all different kinds of people and that was good for us. But now it's like, if you're willing to pay for a blue check, you're probably very, very, very right of center in a way that probably doesn't align with us, which is okay, but it just, it's not as useful those and are, our engagement is just down. Anyway. Yeah. Those are not the people you, you try or try to reach or need to reach. Although if members of Congress are there, as you say, uh, although, yeah. like I said, Threads also has a lot of members of Congress, uh, a lot of brands. The brands jumped on it very hard. And I think the brands are the most desperate to find a replacement for Twitter uh, and have yet to find one. There's Blue Sky. There's there's Threads. There's a lot of wannabes. I guess you include Mastodon in that. But nobody has has taken the crown. Is the crown going to be taken is the question. Do, is there going to be a next Twitter? I mean, or is Twitter going to come back? Or do we not need this kind of microblog platform to begin with? I don't think that there's going to be a next Twitter. I mean, maybe there might in... Uh, I think the thing that made Twitter the platform that it is, that made it this... Uh, huge platform for it made the thing about Twitter that worked as a platform and made it different from say like Instagram or Facebook or Reddit is that it was really good for live events, live cultural moments. If you're watching a football right. game or a episode of the bachelor or uh, you know, the Oscars or something, you could comment live with other people. And sometimes total nobodies would blow up. Sometimes celebrities would blow up virality was kind of baked into it, but also this like real time cultural uh, following aspect. And I think the thing that Threads is missing is, sure, you have a baked in audience already because you're easily able to follow the folks you're following on Instagram and vice versa, but it doesn't have that real time feed. I haven't been on Threads kind of since it launched, but I don't believe it has hashtags or things like that. It seems more like Instagram than anything resembling Twitter. And I think that that is why Threads will never replace Twitter as kind of that cultural touch, touchstone in the same way. I think that Threads might continue to exist and thrive as kind of an offshoot of Instagram, but I doubt that it will replace it in that yeah. way. And I'm not sure that another platform will emerge anytime soon that kind of has that same oomph factor. Yeah. Thread, Threads is very limiting too. They require you to have a device to, to use it. You can't access it on the web. Like they, you know, they, they mm -hmm. have a lot of restrictions. I think they're limiting their, their base. I think at that point, you know, I can guarantee I that absolutely grandmothers that are not going to install like, yeah. another app, you know? I mean, yeah, I, I hate that you can't like easily look at who you're following. Just post from yeah. the folks that you follow in chronological order. It's very right. Instagram of them to do. They have added that tab though, right? The latest edition of Threads has a for you and a following tab, although it reverts as Twitter has for a long time to the for you tab. It doesn't maintain your setting. I mean, they at least listen to people on that. I have to say, Tony, so Tony Bennett passed away very sad this week. He was 96, so it wasn't unexpected. But, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of people posted memories and so forth. And normally I would have gone to Twitter when, when yeah. uh, and to find out, you know, uh -oh, in fact, when you see on trending, it used to be, if you saw somebody's name on trending, you'd go, uh-oh. Uh, I, I found out Rip. on Threads, and Threads had a lot of great posts about it. Same with Sinead O'Connor, uh, who passed also this week. Uh, I thought Threads really had a lot of beautiful stuff. Maybe that's the people I'm following on Threads. Um, I, I have noticed that it's a, a lot less busy than it was when it started. There definitely is a drop in usage. I have been, I mean, this is probably just the circles that I'm in, but I have really been enjoying Blue Sky. Yeah, um, yeah. I know that it's still in kind of It's a, a jolly Twitter. Right. Like it is a jolly Twitter. But I think also <laughs> technically speaking, it fascinates me. It has a feature that I think I don't know why Twitter or other uh, microblogging services haven't uh, adopted, which is um, much like Twitter. You know, you can see your following tab of real time updates from whoever you follow, but you can essentially uh create your own algorithms, right. whether it is something that is like popular with friends, post right. from your mutuals, and anybody can create their own algorithm. So they have like a feature where you could say, essentially, I want to see, you can type even in plain text. I want to see mostly positive posts from people I follow and nothing about 
dating or relationships with an emphasis on cat photos and it will create a feed like that. You could also get technical about it and go in and kind of create your own custom algorithm um, by, you know, I guess like how, t how hard is that to do? Up. Is it uh, do you have to code? Um, the one I described at first, I believe, is really easy. Let me see if I still have it. I thought it was. That's really cool. It's I didn't know skyline that dot gay um, is the thing. And essentially, so if you're looking at it, it will allow you to kind of create a timeline. The base feed could be something like the people you follow or your mutuals or kind of what's hot. And you describe what you want to see more of in plain text. So you could say, like, I want to see wholesome tweets, fun banter. And ah. I want to see less of like angry posts or posts with politics. And kind of the AI will assign a match perspective, like percentage to each post. And um, you can kind of customize how aggressive you want the AI to be. And I just think that is so cool. Like I've been able to create. And so the thing is you can both create your own timelines or you can follow other people's timelines. So, I mean, I on a, let's see, I'll pull it up here. Yeah, I have, I have sky. a variety of feeds and then there's one somebody created called Black Sky, an attempt to recreate Black Twitter, for instance. And uh, and so, well, hmm, I have to be a little careful showing, <laughs> showing, porn? showing Blue Sky. It's not exactly <laughs> porn. Of One of the e ethoses of Blue Sky is that you can show your body even if it's not pornographic or traditionally, you know, it's not a thirst trap. And so there's a lot of people's butts. <laughs> <laughs> but you but can, there's also, you interestingly, can, like features baked in Blue Sky of moderation where you can say, you can, I want to turn that. off the that's things. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I I think that Blue Sky is very interesting. There are a couple of things that make me nervous. One, uh, Jack Dorsey funded it with $15 million when he was running Twitter and is still on the board. So I'm a little nervous. They created their own. The idea was to create a federated social network so that other people could host instances and they created instead of using activity pub which is what the fediverse uses they created their own protocol at proto which is is a fine protocol it's a good protocol uh, it's just different um but they've yet to allow federation so there are no other servers yet and uh and mm -hmm. and the same th by the way threads promises the same thing threads says we're going to be on the fediverse uh we're going to support activity pub but I don't think there's a lot of incentive, really. I think the real, ins the strong incentives are to create a centralized network like Twitter. Yeah. Well, on that note, too, like I really like Blue Sky. I think that if it developed well, it could be it could be the next thing, and it could be better. Um, I love all the customization, but not allowing people in until they have invite codes is something that's invite. really holding it yeah, back. Yeah. yeah. And also, I think with a with a like with having the instances, like I get the appeal of it, but I also think that some people overstate the appeal of it. Like I know a lot of my uh, fellow tech nerd friends are really into it, but my normies are not like, they kind of want to see a little bit of everything. And if you're going to limit them to, oh, you can only see tech nerd posts or you can only see right. Barbie posts or like, this is where you go to talk about each thing. I think it ends up being self-limiting in a way that constrains the platform and it's a little bit more old school, you know? There's another thing keeping any one of these from being the next Twitter is that they all are there. There are many, many more we haven't, haven't mentioned. And so there's no consensus that, oh yeah, we're all, when my, when my space gave way to Facebook, there was just a broad consensus. Yeah. We're all moving to Facebook. I don't know how that happened, but there's so many choices. I, mean, I think the thing is that happens slowly over time. And I think that that's kind of part of the, um, I remember someone asking me right when Elon Musk had bought Twitter during that week when everyone was like posting their tearful goodbyes, like the site was going to implode immediately. They were like, oh, you know, what do you think is going to happen with the downfall of Twitter? I'm like, downfalls of social media sites don't happen in a flash. It happens over a period of time. It will be people stop using the site and like slowly. And then eventually new sites are going to take off. And we don't really know what that new site is going to be and whether it's even going to be a microblogging platform to begin with. Yeah. I guess that was my, the, the root of my question was, do we even need, you know, uh, Linda Yaccarino <laughs> sort of vaingloriously, the new CEO of Twitter proclaimed it the new town square. Do, 
No. <laughs> do we? <laughs> I hope not. Anyway, do we need a town square? Do we need one place everybody goes when somebody dies or when there's an event uh, that we all can go and talk about? Is that, how important is that? I think I feel like all of you, maybe not you, Lou, because you've recused yourself as a as a nerd, but uh, I think people do want. We want, you know, you don't want a town square exactly, but we want a, play, a community that we can go to yeah. and talk, right? Does it have to be the same one for all of us? I, I like the idea of having lots of different ones, like just, you know, maybe there's one where there's a bunch of people and then there's maybe another one where there's also a bunch of people and you also have those silos. But I think it's kind of an all of the above thing that different people like communicating in different ways, in the same way that some people have more stuff they want to put on Discord and some people have more stuff they want to put on Instagram. I just kind of see it as very all of the above kind of thing and like let a million flowers bloom. And I think they will if, uh, if, if the platforms for them are created. Spoken as a true free marketeer. <laughs> um, the only problem with that is it's a lot of work. I mean, I see yeah. George Takei on all of them, right? <laughs> George has a whole team <laughs> posting. George Takei and Ellen are going to yeah. be posting. No yeah. matter what platform, Everywhere. Ellen and George will come. <laughs> yeah. But if you're a normal person posting on six different <laughs> microblogging sites becomes work. Uh, so I think yeah, I will say one side effect of all this is I have no idea what app I am posting on when I open up yeah. whatever dark screen. They all look the same, don't app. they? I'm like, I could be tweeting. I could be skating. I could be threadsing. Who's to say? <laughs> tweeting, skating and threadsing. Oh, my. <laughs> Lou, do you I mean, you probably I do think I think Shoshana's suggesting that LinkedIn for a lot of kind of more businessy people is the place is is the incumbent in that regard um do you use social media lou i mean you Absolutely, post for yeah. work I think it's, it's all i think linkedin by design is that way um you know i think that I, I do agree with having lots of different places to go to be part of some kind of a community i think these places have to have some kind of a critical mass like for instance i use reddit all the time i use reddit for Overflow me the social all the time network. i yeah, use yeah yeah so these are places where people can kind of be themselves or be behind a screen name and and still help and talk and chat. And, you know, I think that threads might be a particular audience and, and so will some of these other ones and they will have their purpose, but there's not going to be one town fault hall to rule them all. I don't think that will exist. Is that a loss? I mean, see, I grew up in an era where there were three networks and if you were lucky, maybe you got four different TV channels. So the chances were very good that when you got, came to work in the morning, everybody had watched Johnny Carson and you could talk about what you saw. Uh, and there was a certain community and, and, and maybe more importantly, a national identity that we had that we've lost, right? Right now, everybody complains about how polarized the country is. I'm not proposing the fact that there are so many TV channels as being the cause of that. But there isn't this, there is a, a schism, a fragmentation of community that hurts us a little bit. We don't have a national identity anymore. How, I mean, I think that this is something we're, I think that it was a fallacy that there was ever an uh, actual national identity uh, just because there were these touch points where maybe a significant part of one's in-group, like we're all watching the same TV show or it seemed the same newspaper. I, I'm not certain I mean, obviously I wasn't alive during, you know, I wasn't watching those three TV channels like you, so I might be wrong here, but I, I think that the world was always deeply splintered and that people had more of just, we're filling in the blanks with the thought of, oh, other people must be experiencing the world like me. And part of what we are now having to reckon with, with the torrent of content we see on social media platforms is that other people do not experience the world like you. Uh, other people are having wildly different reactions to a wildly different array of things. And that is very alienating and difficult to, uh, you know, face. But it's true. But I'm not sure that we can ever put that genie back in the box. It's the truth. Yeah. I think yeah. that's, a, that's very astute. I think you're probably right. And because I'm an old guy, I have this nostalgia for you know, there's a lot of nostalgia for the 50s, right? For this <laughs> this period of time where we were all unified and Eisenhower was president and the middle class was strong. And it, it was like that for some people. If you were black, maybe you don't have such a good feeling about that time. 
So you're exactly, I think you're right. I think that maybe that's a, a form of uh, uh, amnesia, nostalgia, and, and, and maybe wearing blinkers a little bit, blinders, because uh, it maybe wasn't the same for everybody. We just pretended it was. Louis, you said we don't need a, a national identity. You, you have to wonder, do you really want a centralized location? Look, at, I think if we talk, go back to WeChat, right? I mean, they control a lot of the flow of the information. And, you know, and, and yeah, China is an example of a centralized national identity. It's top down, but that's a good point. Right. <laughs> and, and actually, that's what I was getting to is that WeChat could occur because the Chinese government strongly supported it here in the United States. It would be very difficult to do something like that because that's not how we're very much more bloody minded, independent minded in the U.S. And I think Elon's fantasy of an everything app it's just not something that America has ever wanted or could even do. Yeah, I yeah. mean, go back to your original question that kicked this all off. I don't think it's possible for anyone to create an everything app in American culture today because right. these are all already very fragmented things. Yeah. yeah. It is worth noting, too, that Facebook's tried. I mean, if you look at their app store, I mean, I'm not sure if it's still like this, but not that long ago, they had like 40 million apps from Farmville to like, here's how you can pay people via Facebook. And like, they just way overdid it. And everything was possible on Facebook. And it was kind of incredible that they built that. But it was also like, who wants to do this? Who wants Facebook to be the place where they like, sort of bank a little and also take care of virtual yeah, no, animals and no. say hi to the grandma. We don't need it. And in fact, the Federal Reserve Bank this week announced FedNow, a new instant payment system from the U.S. government to compete with Venmo and PayPal and Apple Pay and Facebook Pay. And Zelle. <laughs> and Zelle. Uh, I, I was trying to list all the payment methods for, for a provider. I was, gonna, I was saying, well, how do you want me to pay her? Uh, she was not a prostitute. I was paying... <laughs> I just realized how horrible that sounds. Uh, it was it was actually for my wife who wanted to tip. She'd forgotten to tip her esthetician. I said, well, f ask her which payment system she uses and we can pay her. And I started listing them. And they they go on and on and on. There's an infinite supply, which is good. You know, you can, I mean, you ask a kid. My son says uh, Venmo. Uh, my daughter says cash.me. That's fine. We can do that, right? But I mean, I think this is a uniquely American phenomenon from what I've heard. Oh, I it is. Friends in Europe, you just do a, you know, free instant bank transfer. Yeah, people were surprised uh, everywhere in the world that we didn't have Fed now until now. Every other country, including Canada, has a government's free government provided clearinghouse that's instantaneous. Canada's also wild. When we uh, went there, I was, I didn't like realize that their currency was like loonies and toonies. I thought that was like a joke. <laughs> well, it's slang. So when I went to the bank, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's widely adopted slang. <laughs> still, that's still kind of nuts for a whole country to like literally loony. have Looney Tunes, you know. <laughs> All right, I want to take a little break. Uh, I promise we're not going to talk about Elon the whole time. There are many much more important stories. The NSA wants Congress to preserve a fo uh, you know, data broker's phone surveillance loophole. Uh, there is a res resolution in a long-standing self-driving vehicle death. NASA has launched its own channel. <laughs> Lots to talk about. And Lindsey Graham and Elizabeth Warren sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. -S -S All that coming up in just a little bit. But first, I think, a good time to break. What a great panel we have. I have the perfect panel for today's news stories. From our This Week in Enterprise tech show, Lou Maresca is here from rstreet.org, Shoshana Weissman. She, I, I still think you should still use that tag. She lives in a pineapple under D.C. Now you've just got a field of hot dogs. What's with what's the deal with the hot dogs? Oh, I just love the Snapchat hot dog because they launched it to monetize. And I'm like, this is the dumbest thing ever. I just fell in love with it. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the Snapchat burger. Uh -oh. I once, back in my uh -oh. tech blogging days, went and asked a bunch of different burger chefs about the structural integrity of the burger and they had a lot of things to say about the pickle placement that I can go into <laughs> after break. Didn't Apple, I love it. Didn't Apple when they released a, a hamburger emoji put the cheese on the bottom and it was like a controversial thing? I think I remember Yes. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, we do have a national identity. Don't screw with our hamburgers. 
The One American Meal. That is Paris Martineau. She writes about Amazon and other stuff at the information. Dot com. So great to have all three of you here. Our studio sponsor and our show sponsor today, ACI Learning. I know you've seen the signage all over, uh, but you might say, well, who is ACI Learning? Well, I know you know the name IT Pro. They've been one of our best sponsors and good friends for more than a decade since they opened their studios in 2013. Uh, in fact, Lisa and I flew out when the brand new studios opened in Gainesville. We love IT Pro. Now you get all these additional resources. As part of ACI Learning, IT Pro has elevated their highly entertaining, bingeable, short format IT training with over 7,200 hours now to choose from. And that's not a lot of backlog from old stuff. No, it's all current. They have uh, seven studios running Monday through Friday all day to keep that content current. They're adding new episodes every single day because the IT world is a very changing place. Constantly uh, changing the certs, uh, the, the, the questions on the cert tests. Software gets updated. New software comes. Old software goes. If you're not updating regularly, you're out of touch. And you will love ACI learning. If it... Let, as an example, I mean, it's great for individuals. It's great for groups. If you've got an IT team, you need to know about it. But let's say you're an individual looking to get into IT. You will get a world-class personal account manager at ACI Learning who will be with you every step of the way to make sure you're getting what you need to be successful in your field, to make sure you get the training you need to get that first job. And if you're already in IT, fortify your expertise with access to self-paced IT training videos, interactive practice labs. You can get practice tests. One user shared, excellent resource, not just for theory, but labs incorporated within the subscription. It's fantastic. Highly recommend the resource. Top class instructors. Let me talk about the practice labs. That's very cool. It, it is. You don't have to have Windows to become a Windows expert. All you need is an HTML5 browser. You could use a Chromebook. You could set up Windows servers, Windows clients, all inside the browser in their practice labs. You can break things. It doesn't matter. I just close the tab and move on. It is a great way. MSPs love it, too. A lot of MSPs use IT Pro, not only for training, but these ACI Learning Practice Labs let them test and experiment with software before they deploy them. So it's not. It's really a great way to test stuff as well. Now, let me talk about the practice exams, because the best way, I, I know this from back when I was in high school taking the SATs, the best way to prepare for a test is to take it a few times up front, right? Practice with it. You can take practice IT cert tests so that when you do sit for the final exam, it's familiar, you're comfortable, and confident. ACI Learning brings you IT practice exam questions from everybody. Microsoft, CompTIA, EC Council, PMI, all the certs. You can access every vendor and skill you need to advance your IT career all in one place. By the way, ACI Learning is the only official video training for CompTIA. So if you want to get those A+, Network+, Plus, Security+, Plus certs, those are the, those are the certs people often start with the best way to get that first job but check out their microsoft it training they've got cisco training linux training apple training security cloud they've got it all learn it pass your certs get your first job get your dream job and if you are ready to bring your team along if you're an msp or a company with an it team head over to this special link fill out the form and get a great discount Twit listeners receive at least 20% off an IT Pro Enterprise solution. And actually, the more seats you have, the bigger your discount, up to 65% for volume discounts. Learn more about ACI Learning's premium training options, audit, IT, cybersecurity readiness. It's all there at go.acilearning.com slash twit. So many resources. It is, it is a world of wonder for people in IT. It is fantastic and a great way to learn. If you're an individual, the code for you is TWIT30. That's 30% 30 off a standard or premium individual IT Pro membership. And as I said, big volume discounts for enterprises and groups. Visit go.acilearning.com slash TWIT. We thank them so much for their support, for su underwriting the studio. Uh, they've been a great partner for many, many years, and we're thrilled to have them. Go.acilearning.com slash TWIT. It's not an X story, but it is an Elon Musk story. Big story in the New York Times this Sunday about concern over Elon Musk's power in the stars. That's what the headline said. The tech billionaire has become the dominant power in satellite internet technology. Starlink, 
has 4,500 satellites up on its way to 42,000. It is already with 4,500 satellites, and this is a this is an actual picture of the 4,500 satellites orbiting the Earth. 50% of everything orbiting the Earth is Starlink. 50% of all Earth satellites, Starlink. And one of the concerns is Elon seems a little unstable, shall we say? Uh, what? Really? <laughs> Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was talking in March, according to the Times, with General uh, Zaluzhny, who's the leader of the uh, Ukraine Armed Forces. And Zaluzhny said, because Ukraine uses Starlink for communication in their military, right? So General Zaluzhny said, <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing, what's the deal with Musk? <laughs> so, so he says, Do, does the U.S. have an assessment of Mr. Musk, who has sprawling business interests and murky politics? And the American officials basically said, no, we got no idea what's going on. The fear, for instance, Musk has on Twitter several times said, you know, Ukraine should just surrender, uh, end this war, uh, give give piece of Crimea to Russia and go on. What if he decides all of a sudden to turn off Starlink for Ukraine? Uh, that would be the end of the war. He could literally unilaterally give Ukraine to Russia. A legitimate concern. A lot of power for a man who's... Uh, allegedly on ketamine yeah. most of the day. He tweeted in April, between Tesla, Starlink, and Twitter, I may have more real-time global economic data in one head than anyone ever. Oh, dear. That just sends a, a sharp pain Jeez into Louise. my heart. <laughs> um, I just feel like a lot of leaders suck. Like, just a lot of, like, business leaders and political leaders just really suck. And we're kind of okay that's kind of how I like rationalize feeling okay. And it gets me through the day. I'm not sure if it's going to work for everyone, but it works for me. <laughs> it's funny that here you are in DC and you think that I often in my mind, I think, you know, people who lived under Stalin as an example uh, in, in the Soviet Union under Stalin, who was, you know, arguably worse than Hitler. I mean, he killed more people than Hitler. did. It was a horrible. Uh, but if you're just living in, you know, a suburb of, Leningrad and, you know, just trying to get your life. You're not, you, you can't think about that. You just li live your local life and hope that it doesn't affect you. And I think that's what a lot of people do. They just survive by, you know, narrowing in. Um, and yet here we are, we're in a news organization. We've got to cover this. This is a big tech story. You can't just say, well... <laughs> We're just going to muddle along, Shoshana. We're just going to muddle along. Um, it could it could go bad, right? At least nine countries, including, in, this is the New York Times again, including in Europe and the Middle East, have brought up Starlink with American officials over the last 18 months, with some questioning Mr. Musk's power over the technology, according to two U.S. intelligence officials briefed on the discussion. Few nations will speak publicly about their concerns for... Fear of alienating, alienating Mr. Musk. Oh, boy. Maybe we've dug a hole for ourselves that's going to be pretty hard to get out of. I mean, I'm not advocating. Well, no, no, that's boring company. Oh, that's, that's, their, the, that's the boring company, of that's, course. That's the other That's company. the hole digger. Yeah. Not to mention Elon's plan to put uh, little things in my chips, in, chips the brain. in my brain. And, Isn't there, um, didn't that just get approved for you? Yeah, FDA thing? approval. There's someone out there with a... With a Musk chip in there? Not me. This is his He's just neural sending link company. Them tweets that just say like <laughs> Zuck is a cuck, whatever that one was. <laughs> yeah, literally. That was an actual tweet. An actual tweet. Uh listen, all I have to say is I guess we're uh, in moments like this, I guess we should be thankful that he has like four other companies that he's technically running. Um yeah, because so then he can just mismanage all four. That much. And, yeah. Maybe he doesn't have that much attention on whether or not he should cut Ukraine's access off to web technology. No, but if he decided, if all of a sudden he woke up after a, you know, a long night of MDMA and he woke up and he said, you know, this war has been going on too long. I'm cutting off Ukraine. 
And let's and not ish- put this out there into the world for him to hear. <laughs> he could. There's but- a non-zero chance that he accidentally types. I mean, I guess it's lower now because it's X.com. But he could have accidentally typed twit into the URL uh, browser instead of Twitter and then seen this and the war could be absolutely done though. And it'd all be on you. Leo. He could do so it though, right? Am I wrong? Words. Could he do that? I, I mean, think- yes, he absolutely could. He could call Gwen <laughs> Bell very concerning. at SpaceX and say, you know, let's just give the rockets to Russia. He could call whoever runs uh, Starlink and said, yeah, turn off, you know, the ones over Eastern Europe, just turn those off. There's nobody to stop him. So, Okay, this is depressing, but this does lead us into the question of who, who so okay, I'm going to ask Shoshana, you're, you're our, uh, our token conservative. I'm <laughs> glad we have one on the as, show. As finally. close as we can get. Let's put it that way. <laughs> How do you regulate big tech? It's not just Elon. All of tech, Google, basically Google controls the internet because if it's not in Google search, it doesn't exist, right? I'm sorry, Lou, but nobody's going to Bing to find that site. <laughs> so, You'd be surprised, Leo. No, <laughs> 15% so, of uh, the world goes to Bing. I feel like with, with space, it's a different thing. I don't know space regulation as much. We're starting to get into it a little bit. I'm not. That's a telecom would you, side. Would you please? Because I'm, I'm yeah. worried. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've talked. There's more people in the space field, actually, who have been coming to us being like, oh, can you do more in space policy? We want to see what you're thinking, which is flattering and strange. Didn't think that's where I'd like end up in life, but kind of cool that I have. With other tech stuff, though, I kind of feel like like things really have worked themselves out in addition to existing regulations, like fraud's illegal. So when Meta had its fraud problem and was inflating video views, that was already unlawful. And the FTC was like, no, you can't do that. That's that's fraud. So we, we know fraud's bad and like fraud's something you can't do and it's covered by existing law. But with other stuff, I mean, some of it's just anger at free speech from elected officials. And you see that a lot in hearings when they're like, oh, well, this person criticized me. Why do you still have them employed? Or, um, you know, there, there's not enough of this on your platform, but it's all matters of free speech. So I think, I mean, it's not to say that there can't be other regulation, but I think most of the proposals just have not been tailored to fix problems, but have been tailored to limit speech, which really concerns me and makes me want government less in it. Because while, you know, tech companies are by no means perfect, I think they're a lot better than what a lot of the elected officials are proposing in a lot of cases. Yeah, I mean, so when I see Lindsey Graham and Elizabeth Warren oh. together... <laughs> I, I, it's a I, sign that something dark has happened. So yeah. I really worry. That we have dark energies coalescing. So they uh, have written an opinion piece together, I guess, for the New York Times. When it comes to big tech, enough is enough. Uh, they are promoting uh, legislation to regulate big tech, I guess. And on the one hand, it's clear big tech's not going to self-regulate. Uh, and, and in, there are absolutely instances where, uh, big tech has gotten too big and it's appropriate for somebody to, to do something. But I, I agree with you, Shoshana. I, you know, I, I know Lindsey Graham doesn't want to regulate big tech because, you know, he feels like it's bad for the, uh, the people it's, he wants to regulate it because he wants he feels like conservative speech is being censored. And I know Elizabeth Warren doesn't care about conservative speech being censored. She she was the creator of the, the CPFB. She wants consumers to be protected. So they have opposing points of view, and yet they have united to create yeah. legislation. They say, they say there needs, this is their proposal, there needs to be... Yeah. A regulatory agency, and I'm sure that sends chills down your spine, Shoshana. There needs to be a, <laughs> a regulatory agency to regulate big tech. They say in 1897, the Interstate Commerce Commission was formed to take on railroads. In 1914, the Federal Trade Commission was created to protect uh, against de deceptive acts and practices. In 1934, the Federal Communications Commission took on radio, then TV, the NRC in 75, the Federal Regulatory Energy Regulatory Commission in 77. We need a nimble, adaptable new agency, they write, with expertise, resources, and authority to do the same thing for big tech. 
and they've introduced the Digital Consumer Protection Commission Act. They want to create the Digital Consumer Protection Commission. I don't have high hopes. Hey. <laughs> no, no. Also, for and so by the I way, to, I am a I am a big government liberal, and I don't have high hopes. <laughs> it makes me feel good when people who don't agree with me and all the fundamentals can also be like, "Oh, something's kind of off here." Like Senator Graham, for years in Senate Judiciary, has basically been proposing this and saying we need an agency. But if you listen to his rationales, it's all. First Amendment stuff. He's right. angry at the First Amendment and the way free speech works. And I wrote about this a couple of months ago, actually, in National Review, basically to remind conservatives like, hey, guys, like this isn't going to work out great for us. And if you don't like who's in charge, then maybe you won't like how they regulate free speech in that way. And you shouldn't even if you did like who is in charge. But Graham's been on this forever. Warren just really likes agencies. It's fine if that's her thing, but she just really likes creating new agencies. That's like her vibe. And I think the two of them together were like, oh, a new agency will, you know, do stuff for tech. Um, it's frustrating too, because they haven't really identified something that government cannot do now. Like Congress can like still do stuff and the FTC can like handle stuff. They haven't really identified any new capacity need or any new specific need that doesn't already exist, which for me is always kind of a big thing. Like if the authority exists elsewhere, and it's capable of handling it. And also your job is kind of to do this as Congress, maybe go that route. Graham wants online platforms to have a license in order to oh. operate. You, you say, you write in the National Review, Senator Lindsey Graham's proposal is unworkable, unconstitutional, and dangerous. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I agree. I mean, a license for speech. It's a license for speech. Like that's literally what it is. And my other policy heart is occupational licensing reform. So I see, you know, left and right, how government tries to use licenses to stop people from doing stuff for no reason, to, from arranging flowers to giving tours, actually giving tours, pure free speech. Uh, and those get struck down a lot when they go to court because it's really unconstitutional. And they're like, hey, why don't we nationalize this terrible idea and like make it apply to way more things? And then I just kind of like die a little on the inside, you know? Yeah, that's actually a perfect example of overregulation because, uh, I mean, this is regulatory capture in a nutshell, Yeah. which is I'm a hairdresser and I don't want anybody else to become a hairdresser. So I'm going to have in California higher requirements to become a hairdresser than to become a physician. Uh, as if somehow I am with my shears and my comb, you know, deadly. <laughs> I have to be licensed and highly trained. Hey, so, Edward Scissorhands would like a wound. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's a good point. If the hands are actually scissors, maybe there should be a regulation. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm with, I'm with you, Shoshana, on that. In fact, that's really an interesting and kind of little known issue that I'm, I'm glad you've taken up. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Graham says, you have to have a license to drive. I'm going to give him a bad Southern accent. Forgive me. You have to have a license to drive a car. You have to have a license to sell real estate or practice law, to sell insurance, to sell stock. But the largest companies in the world are not licensed. Right. <laughs> There's a huge difference. <laughs> There's no regulatory agency with any meaningful power to hold them to account. You can't sue them in court. Well, of course, you could sue them in court, by the you way. You could, yeah. I don't yeah. know what, you, what he's talking about. He is an attorney, isn't he? Does he not know the law? No, that, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a senator or a congressman. You can just, like, make stuff up and then say it's law, and yeah. then people just kind of roll with it. Yeah. I've learned this. It's exhausting. <laughs> yeah. This is the new, by the way, and uh, I could, I think we can thank Donald Trump for that, although it, it's got a long and tr tradition in politics. But it turns out you can lie like crazy. It doesn't matter. Like, you can make facts up. Nobody... I mean, the only thing that matters is whether or not you have shame. <laughs> yeah. Lose shame and you can run for president. Uh it's amazing. I mean, I think that's always been true. You don't, I think it probably has. An, an essential yeah. part of running for president yeah. is the absence of shame. I think I am, that's like I step am, two. I've mentioned this before, but I, I just love, this book is sending me. I'm reading Robert Caro's 1,300-page biography of a guy who's not very well known outside New York, but I'm sure you guys know his name, Robert Moses, who was at the turn of the century uh, a crazy power-hungry guy who built all the parks on Long Island in New York and all the parkways. You, Robert Moses has got to be kind of, that has to be the textbook for you, Shoshana. I mean, that is an amazing story. 
Yeah, I uh, I grew up with my dad telling me about like why the bridges were so low and that it was basically racism. And yes. I like didn't fully grasp it as yes. a kid. You're like, what? But yeah, that's- no, it really is. Yeah. So the yeah. so Robert Moses, who loved parks, God bless him, but his vision of parks was not conserving nature. His vision of parks was we're going to build tennis courts and swimming pools and beach facilities, uh, and we're going to take over and six thousand parking spots, ten thousand. The first yeah. that it had ten two parking with ten thousand parking spaces on these two bathhouses on Jones Beach in Long Island, uh, and he did it. Uh, but but what? But he didn't. He said it was really for white people because he didn't. He thought poor people, especially black people, were dirty, and he didn't want them to use the facilities. So your dad was absolutely right. They made sure that the, all the overpasses were too low for buses because they didn't want people who couldn't afford personal autos to come to Jones Beach. And they made black people go to the farther ends of Long Island. They had their own beaches. Now, admittedly, this was in the 20s and 30s, 40s and 50s. And so it was in a time where this wasn't so outrageous a point of view, but it's... He did also, yeah, like raise a number of black communities basically oh, to the ground yeah, so that he could have Bronx clean Expressway. lines yeah, he tore on down. all of his... Uh, Meanwhile, islands. preserving the big estates of the robber barons uh, on, of North, on the North Shore of Long Island, uh, protecting them, but uh, but not worrying about farmers or or, or city dwellers whose uh, houses... Fantastic away. book. How far are you Isn't into it? Isn't it? Have you read it? Yeah. I have listened to parts of it and read parts of it. But, yeah. I mean, that's part I'm, of my... I'm 20 hours well, in. It's, I got... I, I need to cut the book up because physically it's very large. Yeah, I can't read so the book. It's, it's hard too to heavy. carry. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a Kindle. No, I'm listening to it on audio. No, he doesn't allow it on Kindle. That was like, I think, part of his... Oh. Like, part of... Like, I believe Caro has like banned it from being Oh, on that's interesting. Well, thank goodness platforms. he has an audio. He allows the audio book. So I have 40 yeah. hours to go. <laughs> Is the narration good? It's well, the guy has a very kind of deep pedantic voice, so, but it turns out it's a perfect voice to listen to one at one point four speed. He oh, said, perfect! <laughs> so it's really not a sixty hour book. It's uh, it's only like a forty hour <laughs> book. So you know, it's not so. So bad. you okay. should listen to it while driving a large vehicle on Long Island, trying to figure <laughs> out routes. To get to the other side of Long Island. You know what? I, after after reading as much as I've read, it is a it is a great history of the first half of the 20th century in New York City and politics and Tammany Hall and I mean it's it's fantastic. It's widely considered one of the greatest biographies of all time. It's the only reason I'm reading it. I had no idea who Robert Moses was until I. I picked it up. Have you seen the documentary, uh, Turn no. Every Page? <gasps> no. it oh, was about Caro. Um, is it about Caro? About Caro and his relationship with uh, his longtime editor, also named Bob, Bob Gottlieb. And it was um, a documentary oh, I will produced watch by Bob Gottlieb's daughter um, and about the two men's relationship. Um, Did Gottlieb just pass recently? Good. Is he? Yeah, he just, he just yeah. passed like uh, within a month or oh, so ago. Oh, I am... Absolutely going to watch this. Any event, it's a, it's a, I think, it, you know, it's, somebody told me it's on the bookshelves of every senator and member of Congress, even though most of them have not read it, but at least they have it on their bookshelves. It is a, definitely a, a cautionary tale in, uh, in political, absolute political power. Um, it's just, it's fascinating. I can't remember why I brought it up, but uh, it had something to do with this. Maybe it had I to do with the right regulation regulatory capture Regula yeah. yeah yeah that it kind of when you give all the power to one person and i think it's about that good. stuff a lot yeah yeah he he was adept the thing that's interesting it's called the power broker it's also called the fall of new york city so you get an idea of where it's headed but he was adept at pulling the levers of power in such a way the people loved him because he was building parks so he had political power he was like a modern day caesar he had he had political mm -hmm. power and nobody could touch him and so as a result, he became an absolute monarch in his field. And then he did horrible things. <laughs> and so it's a really, it's a very, uh, it's a cautionary tale about. I mean, spoilers, but part of his downfall was him trying to wipe Washington Square Park in Manhattan off the map to have uh, a bunch of different kind of expressways uh, <sighs> and on ramps and off ramps. He loved his and freeways. that ended up being the thing that yeah. uh and I did him in because people were like, you can't get rid of this beautiful park. Yeah, thank God. 
because it is a beautiful park. Yeah. But he was also right when they, they're talking about before all these freeways, if you were going from New Jersey to, uh, you know, Rhode Island, you had to go through the streets of New York, every intersection, one by one with these massive backups. It would take hours to get across Manhattan. So mm -hmm. he wasn't f completely wrong. He, there was a problem to be solved. It's just, and I guess that's really the nut there that often there is something that needs to be solved. And sometimes <laughs> you give somebody so much power that they build a paperclip factory and consume the universe. Um, anyway, uh, let's hope that Lindsey Graham and Elizabeth Warren are shot down. <clears throat> Listen, I think their act, though, Leo, that does have some good components to it. I mean, oh, good. It, You've read it. Are, oh, good. I want somebody who can tell me what's what's good about it. That's good. <laughs> well, I mean, think about it. GDPR in, in the in the EU has done some good things for consumers' data, right? I True. Think that's one of the big things. I you know I think I some of the act has some good sentiment in it. However, there's two there's things that are very broad. Like I you know there's like prohibiting company companies is another one, right? I mean, how they're going to do that? Like how they're going? There's no information about how they're going to prohibit companies from doing stuff and growing too big. And yeah, what's the pe what's the penalty? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think that that means that it's open to interpretation, which means it leads to a lot of other problems in, in the future. So I think the GDPR part of it, the consumer protection part of it, does make sense. I think they should break that out and do that separately. I think that would definitely help people. Warren's website has a, a one-pager, which is probably all I'll ever be able to get through. Choshana, this is your job. You've got to read these bills. Uh, I don't have to. Uh, it's time for a meaningful structural change, they write, to rein in big tech. The Warren Graham Digital Consumer Protection Commission Act would create a new commission to regulate online platforms and data processors. So that's interesting. So Tesla, for instance, might not be regulated. Creating, right, yeah. Yeah, but it, all the social platforms were. That's got to be Lindsey Graham in there. Create an independent bipartisan regulator. Oh, that'll stay bipartisan for a while. <laughs> <laughs> charged with policing the biggest tech platforms like Facebook, Google, and Amazon to promote competition, okay, protect Americans' privacy, good, and to prevent harm online. I'm all for it. Uh, it would empower the commission to enforce violations of the law. Monopoly platforms, don't get this, would risk losing their license to operate. <laughs> If they if they repeatedly violate a law, so it's pre-regulation in a sense. You have to get a license to be a company. Yup, <laughs> and, and that's that's like the prior restraints on speech. Like that's real dangerous stuff because they're these are speech platforms and they want prior restraints on speech, which are usually unconstitutional except in very rare circumstances. I mean, like this would not get through the Supreme Court. Everyone there would like laugh them out of court and be like, why did you pass this? And why are you here? Like every member of the court, like it's just wildly unconstitutional. In addition to being just really, really stupid, like this is just going to enshrine the incumbents because no one else is going to be able to compete. Like that's you know, exactly to get your right. Government license. That's a, well, we have too many lights. It'd be like taxi medallions. We got too many big yeah. tech companies. So uh, you're going to have to wait in line to start your uh, new startup. Uh, I do like pri the privacy stuff. Guarantee users the right to access their personal data, to know when their personal data is collected and processed. Establish, but see, the problem is, again, enforcement requires this licensing. That's the problem here. Establish duties of loyalty, care, loyalty? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is. <laughs> what? Loyalty to whom? Uh, established duties of loyalty, care, and mitigation of harms, including discrimination for all data processors. You know what I can really see? I just imagine, I'm Lindsey Graham's here. He's got a quill pen, and he's got a little pot, and he's writing. And I could see Elizabeth Warren going, no, 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 add discrimination in there. Oh, okay, discrimination. But, yeah. But loyalty, can I keep loyalty in? Yeah, keep in loyalty. <laughs> Limited targeted advertising. Limit targeted advertising based on users' personal. Limit how? Limit to yeah, what? Yeah, exactly. Limit, uh, require, oh, this is the, uh, this is, Lindsay wrote this one. Right, give me the quote pen again. I want to require <laughs> dominant platforms to be owned by U.S. citizens. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's so stupid. I hate this. This is, I have to do this for a living. Do you know how stressful it is to do this every single day and be like, why are you doing this why? to me? Like, come on. No. All right. So, Rarely do I celebrate congressional gridlock. 
<laughs> but but the good news is this. Pro tell me, Shoshana, does this have a chance? I don't think so. I mean, in the House, it would probably die anyway. But what's frustrating is like our street supports a national privacy law. We we understand yes. the need yes. for like better privacy. Yes. But instead of doing that, they're like, how about we do privacy, but with other stuff and in a really terrible and unconstitutional way? And I'm like, can you just do the freaking privacy law? We're just asking for that one thing. But you also understand that. I'm sorry, but I don't trust the Supreme Court. I don't know that th what their idea of constitutional really is. And I, know, I, I mean, do you feel like they're consistent in how they interpret the Constitution? Sometimes they're originalist. Sometimes they're, ah, that's not constitutional. Sometimes they're, oh, you can't. Oh, yeah, go ahead. And uh, like, you don't have to bake a cake for a gay couple. That's not necessary. And so I feel like it's it, it, that is like uh, an unknown. We don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do. For what it's worth here on um, on the recent social media cases, they were very good. And Thomas, who I actually didn't have much hope for. I was for, shocked. Especially, I was yeah, shocked. Yeah, he did great. So I was very happy. I'm like, okay, he gets this. I didn't realize how much of this he gets. That's yes. great. You're talking about the, the Google and Twitter cases, right? The yeah. Two. Yeah. Thomas was the smartest of them all. Yeah, he nailed it. He absolutely nailed it. And I was surprised, but encouraged. And I think on the First Amendment, genuinely, I think the Supreme Court tends to be pretty good overall. It. Okay. Yeah, yeah, especially when it comes to situations like this that are just so, I mean, there's so much precedent here and there's so much agreement on all sides about it. It's not to say it'll always be the case, but, um, you know, and, and I, I don't know, like I call myself an originalist, but like I know that there's different flavors of it too, where people just have genuinely different interpretations of the constitution. I tend to find myself a little more Gorsuch um, than anyone else. But I um, love Alito, we, Alito saying the Congress can't uh, enforce ethics with the Supreme Court. They don't have any, uh, <laughs> that's not in the constitution. <laughs> To switch, somebody said, nor is the Air Force or Space Force. However, <laughs> Congress can make laws. Uh, yeah. Okay. There's layers there, too. To, I, I'll, I can dork on the court stuff forever. But I have I do have faith that if Good. this came before the court, that's they would the just be question. like, no. Like, they would say it. that's ridiculous. <laughs> you cannot. I mean, saying you have to have a license before you can start a ne the next Twitter is really problematic, obviously, for obvious reasons. Right. They made this bill to anger me. <laughs> All right, let's take a little break. And when we come back, uh, I'm going to anger Shoshana some more. It's good. It's fun. It's my new hobby. <laughs> Shoshana Weissman's here. Lou Maresca. Uh, great. To, I love Lou. You're doing such a good job with this weekend enterprise tech. It thank is. You. Thank you. Because, uh, uh, frankly, I find uh, uh, enterprise technology so boring. <laughs> I'm glad we have somebody who likes it. And can talk about it. And you do a great job. You actually make it very interesting. So Appreciate that. I, I do appreciate that. Lou's also a coder, and I like that about it. anybody who can code. A-OK -okay in my book. And uh, from the wonderful information, Paris Martineau and her new frames. And I have to say, very nice. Very Thank nice. You. Your new Matching them to my wall colors. Yes, I noticed. Your new frames were uh, featured on last week's show, by the way. You know, I'm always trying to find a way to sneak in here. <laughs> I was I was showing off x.com and of course I follow you on uh, Twitter and your post was uh right on the front page and so that, you know, that's as just, it should be. As it, as it must be on all shows and for some reason there was just a giant image of you with your new uh, glasses. <laughs> I think if I frames. changed my profile photo. I, yeah. You know, I don't I don't know if you had tweeted a very big shot of your frames or what, but it was like it was so big it wasn't it filled the page and it was you were below the fold. It was like <laughs> you always, That's so funny. It was just a giant <laughs> shot. But I like them. And uh and I Thank think you. you've done a good job. <laughs> so back from her appearance last week on Twitter. Uh, it's spurs. I'm always here waiting in the wings. <laughs> it was like, it was so big. I went, whoa. <laughs> That's going to be you at I IMAX Oppenheimer. Oh, I can't like, wait. Oh. We're going to see Oppenheimer a week from Friday uh, on uh, 70 millimeter IMAX. It is the, the, the film is, I think they said 13 miles. Is that right? 13 miles of film. They had enlarged the IMAX player because it's a three hour movie. It's like 600 pounds of film. Yeah, they use a forklift. There's only 20 theaters in the world that can show this. 
I'm going to one of them in San Francisco. They use a forklift to take the platter, <laughs> lift it, get it, thread it in, and then they have Palm Pilot software to control it. And I guess they decided rather than rewriting the software, they would just use a Palm Pilot emulator on an Android tablet. <laughs> I saw this. Isn't That's that hysterical? It was honestly fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, like this is the future is we're just going to be emulating all of our old tech. Here's the story from, um, this is from uh, Ars Technica. I guess it was a TikTok of the Palm Pilot software running in a tablet for the 70. <laughs> Look at the size of this thing. Uh, they had to extend the platter so it would hold the, uh, the whole roll. And see, it's going off the big roll onto the little roll. Amazing. Anyway. I will give you a review. You've seen it, and you said you want to see it again, so that's that's a good I'm sign. I'm going to see it again, yeah. Yeah. I'm reading the book right now. I'm an Oppenheimer fan. Suddenly, isn't it funny how we get on kicks, like, oh, i got to know everything there is to know about Oppenheimer. You liked it too, uh, Lou, or did you see it? I didn't get to see it yet. I gotta, I'm oh. going next weekend, so I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. You're going to see it in IMAX? I am, yeah. There's one in Providence, and I got the last two seats. <laughs> Uh oh, <laughs> where, where are the last two seats in the theater? The last two seats are actually in the in the reverse that you did it. I actually have the very back. I'd rather have the back that. row. <laughs> I was looking. I don't know why. I thought that the the seating chart had the screen on the bottom. Instead, it was at the top. I thought, oh great, we're five seats from the back. Perfect. Instead, we're five seats from the front. And I. I haven't told my friends that yet. So, I, you know, when you come on the next This Week in Tech, if you have kind of a crick in your neck, <laughs> that the viewers will know why. Welcome uh, to the show. Uh, <laughs> we'll be I am physically incapable I of looking down. Uh, I I don't know what to expect. And and you and you have seen Barbie, too? Is that right? I did Paris? the full Boppenheimer, baby. You did Barbenheimer. No, not yeah. in one day. Yeah, Oppenheimer in the morning, got uh, dinner and drinks afterwards, and then went straight to Barbie. It was great. Oh, my Good light God. end to the, end, to the day, though. Good is that the right the order? Because Barbenheimer replaced right Barbie first, then the nuclear explosion. But you're saying <laughs> nuclear bomb. Yeah, I know. It's con Canonically, it's perhaps a bit out of order because we all know that the nuclear explosion comes after Barbie <laughs> um, chronologically. <laughs> but emotionally, I felt like it was the move. Um and it did. I would honestly, if I was going to do it again, I would give myself a couple more hours to let Oppenheimer <laughs> sit um, before Barbie, but it was great. Now I am death, destroyer of worlds. Does he say that in the movie? In Barbie, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Ken. It's very famous, mm -hmm. Ken. Quote. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. his famous quote. Mm -hmm. Barbie goes, What? Our show today brought to you by Zip Recruiter. Oh, my goodness. If you are hiring, Bless you, right? You are dealing with crazy economic uncertainty. And, and I know this as a small business owner, the ups and downs, you feel, it's like on a road, you feel it in your stomach, don't you? But now you got to hire somebody and the whole thing gets even worse. If you're hiring more than ever, I think it's important that you hire the right person, that you do it fast. Uh, does, is that possible to do, to hire somebody fast and get the perfect person? Yes. Thankfully, there's a hiring partner that's focused on you and your needs, and that's Zip Recruiter. From pricing to technology, everything Zip Recruiter does is for you and what works best for you. Right now, you can try them free at ZipRecruiter.com slash trade. I can say this. I know this from personal experience. It's absolutely true. We use Zip Recruiter. We've hired some of our best employees. What The, the thing about um, a company, especially a small business, it's made of people. And great employees, oh, man, that's fantastic. It's like the information. All great people, it makes it a great place to work. It The, the business soars. But then you bring in one bad apple and the whole thing can go to hell. It's really important you do the right thing. You hire the right people. And this is how ZipRecruiter helps you do that. Well, first of all, it's straightforward pricing. So you know exactly what it's going to cost before you post your job. That helps you stick to your budget. And these days, that's important. There's no surprises. But then... You know, assuming the right person's out there, and I think if you if you cast a broad enough net, there is that perfect person. ZipRecruiter does that. It sends your job post to more than 100 different job sites. And then they do something that's very clever. 
See, they have a million current resumes on file because people come to ZipRecruiter looking for work. They use AI to look at those, to look at your job requirements, and to make a match. Now, they don't tell that person about the job. They tell you about that person. So then you can look, you know, with your human eyes at these applicants and say, yeah, these person, oh, that one's good, that one's good. And you can invite the best matches to apply for your job. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, it brings people to you. So it's much more likely you're going to find the right person. Second of all, when you invite somebody to apply for a job, that is, you are starting way ahead, huge head start. That is flattering to them. They're much more likely to go through the process. They're much more likely to take the job. Beat, and you will be beating out the competition because you'll get to those talented people right away. I think ZipRecruiter is fantastic. Hire the best with the help of a partner who's all about you, ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. We've, our experience been within the first hour or two. I mean, it really, it's kind of amazing. Just go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. That's what we do. ZipRecruiter.com slash T-W-I-T. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. I think if we're talking privacy, uh, we've got to talk about the NSA and their lobbying. This is from a Wired story. Uh, U.S. spies are lobbying Congress to save a phone surveillance loophole so i agree with you uh i think all of you that our personal privacy is important we live in a, a, an ad supported economy where advertisers really want to know about customers and so a lot of platforms that have average all the platforms that have advertising except maybe with a, maybe with the exception of podcasting because we can't we'll gather information about all the people who visit and use that, Facebook's a perfect example, Google too, with their AdSense. Use that information to sell those ads to advertisers. I think that's fine. That's kind of how it's working. Uh, you take that away, suddenly you, you know, you don't have a backbone. You don't, the information has to be, well, it is subscriber only, right? But there are very few publications. Subscription only, no there, ads. There are baby. very few publications that can do that, right? Most, most blogs sure. like The Verge and, and, and Gadget all have to have advertising. We have advertising. I would love to be all subscription, but on the other hand, I also like it that, that you don't have to have money to listen to our shows. You just have to listen to ads, too. Anyway, I think that, that that economy makes sense. The problem is all this information that's being gathered is and not just by ad services, but by your ISP and, and by your television set and on and on, is being then sold on to data brokers. And the data brokers who have no connection with you, you're not their customer, they take that and sell it on to the highest bidder. Which is why I think the, all of the upset about TikTok was misguided because China doesn't need TikTok to get information about me. They can buy it on the open market. They, it's all available. So uh, the uh, Warren Davidson and Sarah Jacobs in the House have uh, have uh, introduced an amendment which would. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention one more other point. It's not just TikTok. And advertisers that are buying this data, law enforcement is buying this data. Law enforcement buys location data. Uh, and in fact, according to this amendment, military agencies like the NSA purchase data that would, quote, otherwise receipt require a warrant, a court order, or a subpoena to obtain. Why get a subpoena? Why get a warrant if you just go to the open market and buy it, right? Mm -hmm. So this uh, amendment... Uh, which would ban more than half of the U.S. intelligence community, the NSA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Space Intelligence Center, among others. Uh, it was added to the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, we all agree. Shoshana's nodding vigorously. So is it makes Paris. me so happy. So is, I just love this this yeah. concept. Like the government's getting around the Fourth Amendment by like buying data. Senator Wyden has been on this forever, and he's he's a really big proponent here. But like this is a really big loophole that government just uses to evade the Fourth Amendment. So it's one of my one of my side favorite things that the government's trying to reform here. God bless Ron Wyden. 
Uh, he's reintroducing it in the Senate uh, as the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act. <laughs> He writes, Americans of all political stripes know their constitutional rights should not disappear in the digital age. There is a deep well of support for enshrining protections against commercial data grabs by government into black letter law. So, yeah, they're going around your your right to it's not a right to privacy. The Fourth Amendment says the right to uh, against search and uh, seizure. Right. Yeah. And and it says it has to be a warrant. And it has to be probable cause. Then the probable cause, you go to the judge. The judge says, okay, there's probable cause. Here, there's a warrant. You can go search that house or that car. Um, this gets around it. The, the Wired writes, the extent to which the NSA in particular uses data brokers to obtain location and web browsing data is unclear. Although the agency has previously acknowledged using data from, quote, commercial sources in connection with cyber defense. Regardless, the NSA's lawyers have authored extensive guidelines for acquiring commercially available data. Um, although we know the guidelines exist, but some of the rules are classified. <laughs> uh, what we do know is the NSA is, according to Wired, lobbying hard against these two bills. They say we need to be able to buy this data. We don't want to get... Now, all right, look, the NSA... is protecting us against the worst kind of terrorism and things like that, right? Yes? No? That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will yeah. never know, right? I mean, that's the point. It's so secret, we don't know what they're doing. That's right. Um, but but I, if it were the CIA, I might feel bad. But the CIA does international stuff. What is the NSA's charter? The NSA can do anything they uh, want. Unwarranted spying on American <laughs> uh, phone calls and, and they have a, private they, matter. They built, I mean, I think that's kind of the whole point, they right? They built the world's <laughs> largest data center. Where where was that? In, in the Middle West somewhere. To house all this data they were snarfing up from electronic transmissions and the internet. Well, I mean, they've got to get, uh, they've had to build that because, um, in Utah specifically that it was, there was too much. Um, it was hard to find storage for all of the recordings from all of your different phones, Leo. Um, <laughs> specifically once they started tapping you they were like, we got to get another data center. It, 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 it was built in 2014, $1.5 billion, the Utah data center. This is the closest picture we can get. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, photographer was shot immediately. Immediately, after. but at least he got the one picture. Uh, critics believe the data center, this is from Wikipedia, have the capability to process, quote, all forms of communication, in, all forms of communication, including the complete contents of private email, cell phone calls, and internet searches, as well as all types of personal data trails, parking receipts, travel itineraries, bookstore purchases, and other digital pocket litter. Oh, and let's add all the stuff they buy from data brokers. Uh, some of this they're storing because it's encrypted and they're expecting someday to be able to crack that encryption and find out what you were talking about back in 2019. Uh, so, be, I mean, if they are really lobbying, and I, I have no reason not to trust this article, that kind of tells you uh, that they are buying this data and they don't want to have to get a warrant. I, could say, I can understand that they may say, I'm trying to put myself in... In, this, in the shoes of the spooks, uh, that if we, that's revealing our methods if we go to a court. But there are FISA courts. There are secret courts you can go to. Yeah, yeah we have like a lot of secret courts. Like that, that's kind of like they're, like if they, if they were like, oh man, we don't have to go to the secret courts, you know, that's so much extra work. We just want to be able, like, that's really messed up, you know? That's, I mean, that's but that truly is a, a primary argument, I believe, that they've had before the Supreme Court often yeah. is uh, they're like, oh, the secret courts are too much work. The courts where I think they, the uh, denial rate is something like, it's definitely below 5%, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, it is like once in a blue moon will their secret court requests ever get denied, and that is too much for them. It's so hard to be the NSA, guys. I don't Again think with a secret court. Enough. Again. The NSA is in charge of signals intelligence. I think that's the short form of their mission, which means exactly what we just described, is snarfing up 
all the possible radio, telecommunications, internet traffic that can in order to try to figure out, I mean, if you interpret it positively, in order to try to figure out what, to, you know, that's the terrorist chatter you hear about, uh, where the next attack on the U.S. is, is going to come from and prevent it. And as far as we know, they're doing a great job. Um, there haven't been a lot of terrorist attacks on our soil since 911. I mean, you know, brief blip in uh, 2021, early on in that year. But uh, other than that. I know. think those are mostly domestic, weren't they? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but that signals intelligence would have found, maybe you found that as well. Um, I mean, I don't want us to be unsafe. It seems like they could go to the FISA courts, though. It seems like they could go to the secret courts and say, look, uh, you know, we need to buy this. We need to know where Leo Laporte was for the last 40 days, just in case. Pro you know what the real issue is? I think it isn't Leo Laporte. We know that we need to know where every citizen of Manhattan was, who they spoke to, because you're using AI and other technologies to cross-reference and try to find patterns. That sounds right, Lou. Yeah, I mean, most people's data is just collateral damage to what they're looking for, and so I think, I think that's main point is just trying to connect the dots, and I think it, sometimes it's going to have to go through everyone's data to, to find that out, essentially. So I'm not sure I'm against it. I mean, I think we have, you know, a part of our constitution that does ostensibly protect us against unwarranted search and seizure, and uh, allowing an entire operation and part of the government to be constantly essentially searching and seizing our data all the time and having real-time access to where we are what we're saying and um the things we are doing would technically be a breach of that i mean obviously i guess if the courts decide to rule against it and weaken that aspect of the constitution that would be one thing but um i think that's probably where so you going. too are an originalist aren't you paris martin I am not an originalist, <laughs> but I will weaponize the Constitution for my uh, own personal interest. When, <laughs> because that's what we seem to be doing these days. When the Fourth Amendment was written, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have telephones. We didn't have telegrams. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, you know, parchment. So, in fact, <laughs> I know that because I have a picture of the Fourth Amendment uh, on parchment right here in front. <laughs> in front of me <laughs> oh yeah that's that's the original text i believe <laughs> the right of the people to be secure in their persons houses papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized but how do you do what lou and i were just talking about this broad a, a, a dragnet search or whatever it's called. Yeah, so, uh, well, sometimes you call it a fishing expedition. And so there is examples. Um, there was a, a recent case. I think it might be going to the Supreme Court, uh, where uh, a the FBI I think asked Google. They do they do this from time to time. Give us the location of everybody near this Seven Eleven. So we could figure out who the crooks were who robbed it. That's a fishing expedition, right? And it, it, it infringes everybody's rights. You can't give a warrant. Maybe I guess you could. I mean, maybe, maybe a judge would say, yeah, you need that information. Right. Yeah. The interesting thing about the, this section, Louis, Leo, is like Section 702 has been around since 2008. And so you kind of have to think about like, if people really had a big problem with it, why hasn't it been repealed since then? Well, the Patriot Act's been around since 2001, and it keeps getting renewed uh, because you don't want to be the member of Congress who enabled a terrorist attack on the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Uh, that would look very bad, and the NSA would be very happy to say, you know, see what uh, Congressman Laporte did? He blew up the bridge because he wouldn't let us collect data. Congress and like the federal government also just love extensive national security authority, even if it doesn't have stuff to do with national security, if it's ever done under the guise of it, like that's staying forever. And it, it you can start to narrow away on it, but it, it's just really hard to 
do. And I think a lot of this also just gets a third party doctrine because like data brokers are the third parties. You know, the first party is the the guy whose data it was and then the government trying to get that. It's like, oh, well, that's a third party. So they don't have any interest. But uh, years ago, the Supreme Court had a case and Gorsuch also there had a really interesting opinion trying to figure out like the, the right way to see data property rights. And the court was all split on it. But they basically said, yeah, people have an interest in their data, even if other people have it, which was good because third party doctrine really sucks. I, mean, I lost my uh, <laughs> I got so excited. I leapt to my feet to yell and I unplugged my headphones. So <laughs> just a second. So we could be saying anything about you, Leo right now, can, and he won't have an idea. Uh, I think we talked about this last week, but this is related. Uh, it's about uh, cameras. They're everywhere. I remember the Petaluma, uh, I guess, police, I don't know, city government put up cameras on all the uh, uh, stoplights in the town, right? And the theory is what? They're going to catch speeders? I don't know. But what's happening is, in fact, uh, they're, they're using software to collect every driver's license, every car make and model that goes by these cameras and then cross-referencing them. And so there is a case, and I don't know uh, where it stands right now. I mentioned this before. The Westchester Police Department had a surveillance system. Uh, it was built by a company called Recor. There are other uh, companies that do this. Uh, but it takes all the cameras, the police cameras, but also cameras in police cars, the traffic cams and uses automatic license plate recognition to search for plates. But, and usually when the password it would do is, Oh, we know the plates of this bad guy. He drove away from the bank robbery. Where is he? But now what they're doing is they're, they're actually getting all the plates. Westchester County has 480 cameras collected data over two years and <laughs> noticed that there was a car uh, that was stopping short stops all over the county, the kind of activity that a drug dealer would engage in, uh, going to the places that uh, they knew that drug dealers would go to sell drugs and so forth. Let me see if I can I can read you the honestly unless unless there's explicit laws like for instance Washington State has one that says you can't use red light cameras or speed light cameras for anything other than traffic enforcement. So there if you're you looking go. for somebody who's stolen something, you can't you can't do it. But there's I would say there's a majority of the states that don't have laws like that, which means they're probably doing it too. Uh, this guy was driving down the Hutchinson River Parkway in Scarsdale in a gray Chevrolet, but. According to uh, this new AI tool that the Westchester County Police Department was using, it was suspicious because it was on a journey typical of a drug trafficker. It made nine trips from Massachusetts to different parts of New York, following routes known to be used by narcotics pushers and for conspicuously short stays. The Westchester Police pulled him over on those grounds. So they had this database of licenses the AI said, this guy is suspicious. They pulled him over. Yes, they found 112 grams of crack in, in, in his possession, a semi-automatic pistol, and $34,000. So the AI was right. But at the same time, so this is, the, this is similar, right? I'm sure that this is the kind of stuff the NSA does, except it's not looking for crack dealers. It's looking for terrorists, or maybe it is. I don't know what they're looking for. No one does. Um, his attorney uh, is now uh, appealing it saying because uh, this is the specter of modern surveillance the Fourth Amendment must guard against. The systematic development and deployment of a vast surveillance network invades society's reasonable expectation of privacy. The Fourth I Amendment... I do, I think, agree protects. with this. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that we should necessarily have cameras policing everyone's movements at all times and having some... System, it's 1984. You know, human or algorithmic deciding who or what could be possibly committing a crime. Yeah. Well, and the secondary concern is, I mean, no one's in favor of crack dealers, but it also, Sacramento County, and up here in Northern California, shared license plate reader data with states that have banned abortion. Yeah, I was about to say, I mean, it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. 
it, one it, uh, project that I think is kind of interesting is um, there's this company called Adversarial Fashion that is, I think, I think just a program of um, one woman. Um, but it specifically, cr they create uh, merchandise like sweatshirts, T-shirts that look kind of like a jumble of patterns and text. And essentially what they're supposed to do is um, they target these automatic license plate readers and uh, you can see on them, they kind of look like license plates. So if you're walking by one of these readers, it will read this and then insert junk data <laughs> into the automatic Good. license plate. Let's readers. all get hoodies um, from these guys. This, so I often this, will wear it mine while I'm biking Oh, you have around. one. Oh, I'm that's awesome. Resistance a little bit. Oh, I love that. This is specifically to defeat ALPR, which you were just talking about. Yeah. Ah, oh, and it's also pretty good looking. Yeah, and they have a bunch <laughs> of different types depending on like the state or country that you're in. This actually um, has the Fourth Amendment in license plates on it. That's, that's hysterical. Cool. Uh, good. I like it. Wouldn't that be funny if the police are going through their license state, state, place database and the AI says, we have discovered the text of the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you should read We've discovered this. suspicious activity and then they enhance. A constitutional a originalist bicycle. right yeah. there on the bicycle down the street. Um, but, but you see the... the, the because the... The founding fathers did not envision a connected society like we have. Does the Fourth Amendment st still make sense? I guess it does, right? I mean, the principle of it is sensible. Yes. For what, for what it's worth, too, I also view stuff not just original. Like, I don't believe in original intent originalism, like the vibes of the founders, but what they actually <laughs> wrote. Oh, okay. And as, <laughs> you know, as it applies to modern, but that means that, like, unreasonable search and seizure right. applies to digital methods and all other kinds of stuff. So, you know, if you, you know, the, the fourth amendment applied to a lot of the stuff would be a very obvious, like, Oh, you can't do that. You can not just search people's stuff like constantly that. all the time. <laughs> you can't do that. Uh, what a world we live in. All right. Uh, let's find something fun. Facebook just passed 3 billion users for the first time. Okay, that maybe is not is so Is that much Facebook fun. specifically or Meta? Uh, no, it's Facebook. Yeah. Whoa. They've been slowly inching up. It slowed down. Remember, uh, we every year, you know, we'd say, oh, now it's 100 million. Now it's 200 million. Uh, here's a graph of monthly active users. And you can see it's flattened down a little bit, but it's finally crossed 3 billion. That's almost half the population of the world, right? But not bots. Whoa. How all bots? grandparents. <laughs> How many grandparents are there in the world? <laughs> Guess three billion. <laughs> uh, user growth has mostly plateaued for Facebook in recent years. Its monthly user growth base, and this is from Facebook's quarterly results, growing by 3% since this time last year. Uh, that's half the growth rate of WhatsApp. Instagram and Messenger, which is why, by the way, Facebook bought WhatsApp and Instagram. Instagram at a billion dollars was the deal of the century, it turns out. Um, your, your company, Microsoft's trying to buy Activision for $70 billion, 70 Instagrams. Um, and it's going to do it, by the way. It. Congratulations on victory. I hope it's worth it. I hope it's worth it. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of money. It's more than they spent for LinkedIn. It's the largest acquisition uh, in the history of Microsoft, and it's one of the largest acquisitions of all time. Yeah, uh, the FTC the games has, are good. FTC has lowered the flag; they've they've declared defeat. Um, they're not going to pursue it. Gearing up it. for a big Amazon battle, they've got to oh, cut yeah. their losses. Oh yeah, uh, I'm a I, I'm a Lena Khan fan. Uh, I thought uh, Cory Doctor. You're a con head. I'm a con head <laughs> with a K, not a C. <laughs> I am. Yeah. I love it. Um, although now that uh, Connor uh, and uh, Willa have been marching in the uh, SAG strike, I'm kind of a con head for them again. Uh, you're you're a con head uh, in both senses. <laughs> I'm a neo con head. Uh, oh my gosh! <laughs> we're, for those who are puzzled, we are talking about a TV show called Succession, and. Uh, and uh, we can't get over Fans the fact of that Fans of one of the characters, over. Connor, would call themselves Con Heads. He was running for president and See, didn't have a lot of support. But in his concession speech, 
He said, all right, all right, I lost, but I'm still a billionaire. <laughs> Which is exactly the way to look at it. Um, let me see, where am I? Uh, Corey actually is going to be on the show, I should mention. Uh, Corey Doctorow and his uh, co-author uh, of his uh, the newest book, Choke Point Capitalism, we are going to do a takeover on Twitter. I'm very excited about this in a couple of weeks. Is that a hostile takeover? No, it's a, we love them. Uh, Corey Doctorow and Rebecca Giblin will be on August 20th. Um, so we will be talking about uh, Corey's stuff, but he wrote, I thought, a very uh, good piece. And of course, I'm trying to find it. He always writes very uh, good pieces about, gosh, he is really uh, completely on everything going on in the world. Private equity ghouls have a new way to steal from their investors. Denazification, the truth of Germany's story. Podcasting, let the platforms burn. No, none of this is, I forgot. Oh, why they're, here it is, why they're smearing Lena Khan. My God, Corey writes, they sure hate Lena Khan. <laughs> and of course, what he's talking about is the Wall Street Journal and others uh, saying, Khan, it, why does she keep losing? She's a loser. She's 0-4 in the courts. Why does she keep pursuing this stuff? On the other hand, and this comes back to this government regulation, the, this is the FTC's role. And I think I think many of you listening may not agree with her trying to stop Microsoft from buying Activision. Frankly, I think that was a, probably a fool's uh, errand. Although, she had a, I mean, there's a point to be, I won't argue, but there's a point to be made there. But she is going after things like she, she wants uh, it is easy to cancel a subscription as it is to make one. Who could be against that? The FTC is doing a lot of, I think, good work. Um, okay, maybe they couldn't keep Facebook from buying within. Maybe they couldn't keep Microsoft from buying uh, Activision. Uh, perhaps because, uh, you know, the courts are a little bit more bullish on trusts than uh, the FTC, but that doesn't mean she's not uh, doing her job. I mean, I think the thing a lot of people don't understand is that Lena Khan's goal ultimately is to kind of shift the window there on go. how the courts and the FTC view kind of the consumer welfare standard and just generally how they, the approach to American antitrust law in general, shifting it away from kind of the... Uh, the legal standards uh, professed by like Robert Bork. Um, Bork the was the creator of it, right? The, he was the I guy. Mean, yeah, yeah. He, he's the, you know, total father of modern antitrust law right. and kind of centering it around this idea that it should be all tied back to economic efficiency and consumer welfare. Um, and Lena Khan specifically, you know, um, believes that there should be kind of a new approach to all of this. She famously wrote that paper called the Amazon, like antitrust paradox. Right. And I think that when your goal is shifting an entire body's approach so dramatically, it's obviously going to take a while. It's going to be kind of a long game that you're playing. Thank you. You said that so beautifully. I've been trying to say that in a much less eloquently uh, for some time that this, this, this is important to at least get companies to start thinking about, well, maybe we don't want to get sued over this. Maybe this isn't the right thing to do. And I also want to thank you for not using the word Overton when you said window. So thank you for that as well. But I, I think you're I right. I not remember whether it was Overton or I was going to confuse it with uh, Ovaltine. So I <laughs> Let's to cut shift out the, word the Ovaltine window. So, I agree. I think we should all shift the Ovaltine I, window you know, to oat milk. Yeah. I agree so heavily with that as well. You are so smart. Um, yeah, it's I. I don't know, Shoshana. Where do you where do you stand uh, on on this? I mean, I think we all agree that there is some regulation necessary. We also agree that sometimes you can overregulate, and maybe government isn't the best way to do this. But if not the FTC, if not Congress, then who? Nobody's going to regulate these guys. The, we can't let the EU do it all. 
I just like the consumer welfare standard. I'm not a big fan of con, but I get why people are, you know, it's just a difference of like fundamental views and stuff. But for me, it's just, if there's no harm being caused and if the only issue is that something's really big, I just don't think that should be the role of the FTC. Like I'd rather them step in actually um, for rental car companies, which steal money from people and put them in jail. Like that seems like when Hertz was doing that, that seems like a very clear role for the FTC yeah. where, yeah. you know, local law enforcement isn't really doing anything about it. And there needs to be something to be done because Hertz is throwing people in jail, which isn't cool. I had my money stolen by Avis and it took like a lot of time for me to get it back. And to me, that's like a lot bigger deal than just having seven clicks to do Amazon, which is if she wants to go after companies harder, just strategically at, at this point, I feel like it would be more worth it for her to do things that everyone is like, oh yeah, no, this is ridiculous. Like there's no way you can see the other side of like Avis stealing money or, or Hertz throwing people in jail. And then moving from there, if she wanted to strategically like change the conversation, just get some wins and then, you know, go a little bit more that way. I mean, it's, I mean, of course you could say, do, you know, hit, do the low hanging fruit, but I think Khan uh, has a larger, and I think Biden as well, bringing in Tim Wu and Jonathan Cantor has a larger vision for antitrust, you know, uh, Corey's position, and I and 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 I think you probably agree, Paris, because this is this goes back to Robert Bork was the Reagan era shift in how we enforced antitrust, uh, and in fact, basically didn't. Um, Bork, you said, believed in the efficiency of markets, and you want to preserve the efficiency as opposed to consider consumer harm or the harm to, which I think is really important, the harm to innovation of these large companies. It makes it very difficult to, uh, to be, uh, you know, if you're an incumbent pulling up the ladder, because it's very difficult for the little guy to create the next big thing. And I think and that's I ultimately like the important thing here is not even looking at it. Consumer welfare standard versus not. I think that my understanding of Khan's kind of approach to this and this movement in general is that they're seeing that what the current state of antitrust um, regulation looks at consumer welfare in a very narrow manner in the sense of is this company uh is this company's actions resulting in the cost of my whatever i'm buying on amazon being higher than it otherwise would be is this having a uh demonstrable monetary impact uh on the consumer in a negative way and i think that the concept of consumer harm or consumer welfare is a lot more complicated than that and i think that part of this legis like this regulatory movement that they're enacting is trying to unpack the second tier and third tier effects of a corporate action in a way that then you could perhaps you know take regulatory action on it or not yeah it's hard it's easy uh, i mean Corey talks about this when he's talking about in shitification and he uses amazon as an example as did lena khan that uh, it's easy to see in the early days of amazon uh, it was great for customers, right? But uh, mm -hmm. that wasn't the end game at all. Uh, that stage two and stage three uh, ultimately ended up in, you know, capturing more. Stage three was capturing more profit uh, from both customers and businesses, and ultimately raising prices once there's no more competition. Uh, and you know, I think that that's that is a more long term, more nuanced uh, look at consumer harm than just well, what's the price today? Uh, of a book books were cheap on amazon for a long time until they cornered the market on books and all your bookstores closed uh, i mean it's the same thing we're seeing now with uber and lyft you know yeah. they were incredibly cheap rides in the time where they're just trying to capture market share and now that they actually have to try and make money it's like 50 dollars to get across town yeah i wish we had an ovaltine ad right now i really do because i think <laughs> you, you could be the Ovaltine window. <laughs> Do you yeah. remember Ovaltine? You're too young to remember Ovaltine. I think my understanding of Ovaltine is just from other people remembering. You Ovaltine never had Ovaltine. And seeing yeah. Ovaltine ads. You can buy Ovaltine still, I think. Of course, I have it, I have it in the cabinet. Do you? Do the kids love oh, yeah. Ovaltine? It's great. Yeah, it's a malt. It's great. <laughs> I love Ovaltine. Yeah. Yeah, uh, You're going to walk back from the ad break just sipping some cold Ovaltine. <laughs> I should go get it now. <laughs> uh, let me let me just give you an idea of uh, what Ovaltine means to people of my generation. This is an Ovaltine TV commercial. We're going to take a break and come back with more after the commercial. Here we go. Hey, listen, Nestle, quick. 
Dad quits out. We switched to Rich Chocolate Ovaltine. Why? Ovaltine's better for you. It has vitamins and minerals. Quick doesn't. And it tastes great. Mmm, it is great. More, More Ovaltine, Ovaltine, please. <laughs> You've shifted okay, the Ovaltine. I've absolutely Ovaltine. seen a thousand ads that have said More Ovaltine, please, <laughs> that awakened some sort of sense of memory deep in my brain. And uh, I'm being told that during the ZipRecruiter ad, you shifted the positioning of your mannequin. Uh, oh, I did. I don't know if you can see it now because I'm. Someone in the chat was like, <laughs> "Where's your Where's mannequin, the butt? mannequin butt?" Mannequin butt. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the arts and crafts projects of Paris Martineau. People Careful. Continue to bring up. They have to, they have to give the people what they want. Clearly. Give the people what they want, Martineau. We're going to take a little time. <laughs> Out. We'll have more. This is of my favorite panel. I don't want this show to ever end. Lou Maresca, it's great to have you. Paris Martineau from The Information. Shoshana Weissman, she lives in a pineapple under D.C. Hey, I want to thank everybody in uh, Club Twit for your support. This is something we launched a couple of years ago. Lisa, uh, our CEO, said, we should give our audience a chance to support what we're doing, uh, plus have ad-free versions of all of our shows, uh, and the revenue from that can help us generate new content, new shows. And it has been a great success. So thank you to all our Club Twit members. If you're not yet a member of Club Twit, 7 bucks a month, not much, $84 a year. We also have family plans and corporate plans. In fact, we just got a new uh, corporate member. Thank you. Uh, it, of course, you get the warm feeling in your heart that you're supporting what we're doing. But you also get a lot of great stuff. Access to the Discord full of animated uh, GIFs. And in the Discord, thanks to our community manager, Aunt Pruitt, does, does such a great job. Lots of special content. Shows like Scott Wilkinson's Home Theater Geeks, Hands on Macintosh with Micah Sargent, Hands on Windows with Paul Therott. Aunt's going to be doing a photo critique uh, August 4th. We've got a photo walk coming up at the end of the month. I'm going to go on that with uh, Aunt. Stacy's Book Club. Stacy Higginbotham does a monthly book club. And Aunt has just scheduled, I'm very excited about this, Oh, wait a minute. I'm very excited about this. And an AMA with, look who's there, Lou Maresca, September 28th. That'll be something to look forward to next month. Thank you, Lou, for doing that. Find Thank out the real me. truth behind Lou Maresca. Uh, we also have a fireside chat coming up. Ant uh, did a great interview a couple of weeks ago with Hugh Howey. He's the author of the Wool series of sci-fi novels. That was turned into a great TV show called Silo on Apple TV+. And uh, another of our favorite sci-fi authors, Daniel Suarez, will join. And I'm going to go to this one. This one I'm going to be in because these are two of my favorite people. I'm looking forward to that. And I haven't met Hugh Howie, so I'm looking forward to that. So that's a special event. These are all things going on in the club that you get. <laughs> and not to mention animated gifts galore that you... <laughs> That you get with your seven bucks a month. It is so much fun. Uh, there are uh, there is a Malala as Barbie, which which is great. This Barbie has a Nobel Prize. He's just Ken. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, thank you for your support. If you want to join, we would love to have you. Twit.tv slash club. On we go with the show. Let's see what other news is uh, hot and happening. Um, NASA, I mentioned, is starting its own channel, NASA Plus. It's like Apple TV Plus without the fees and the ads. Um, it's the space what agents. What is going to be on there? Space, baby. I oh, wonder. Wow. I have, live space. Live space. I, do they have, John, tell me. They have, I asked John if they're going to have sci-fi movies, like maybe Bruce Willis saving the planet. No. It's just going to be uh, live, but it's not. there's not enough going on all the time. Reruns? Okay, they should have ancient aliens on there. <laughs> I think that would be a really good content synergy experience. There, there's apparently a lot of programming. If you have the NASA app on your phone, uh, you'll be able to use that, the uh, agency's iOS and Android apps. There's also the uh, desktop feeds and uh, mobile browsers, as well as stream shows on demand through media players like Roku, Apple TV, and Fire TV. And it is free because, as John has pointed out, we already paid for it with our tax dollars. Yeah. 
Unless uh, you're Bernie Madoff, in which case you don't get to watch it. I don't know. <laughs> You've got. <laughs> I wa I watched the uh, the Beanie Baby movie uh, last night. Have you seen that yet? It's on Apple TV Plus. It's about Ty Warner and his creation of BB Beanie Babies. And I was really curious. Is this a new movie? Yeah, it just came out a Friday on Apple TV Plus. Oh, you're probably of the age where you might have had some Beanie Babies. You too. Yeah. You three. No Beanie Babies. Yes. I've had Beanie Babies. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I have a lot Cabbage of... Cabbage Patch, Beanie Babies. Yeah, I had a lot of Beanie Babies. <laughs> My daughter was really into them and we bought every one of them. We didn't collect them. Uh, anyway, the, the story is actually interesting because he hired a young college freshman at, kind of as an intern, a receptionist, $7 an hour receptionist. Actually, it was less than that. It was minimum wage. But she, and this is in the early 90s, she knew about the internet. She was a computer science major and said, you know, we should have a web page. No one had web pages. They created the, she created the first ta Beanie Baby web page, but then did something really smart. She noticed that Beanie Babies were being resold for profit on eBay. Ty Warner said, we should shut that down. That's violating our trademark. She said, no, you don't understand. This is creating a secondary market. People will buy our Beanie Babies with the hopes of reselling them for vast sums on eBay. Uh, I guess he got it because he let her do that. And they got a lot of information, market information, by monitoring the, very early on, monitoring the internet, something everybody does now, for sentiment analysis, for dollar values, for which Beanie Babies to stop selling, which Beanie Babies to introduce. Uh, and she helped uh, make it the most successful toy company of all time with a billion dollars in sales one year. Uh, but of course, as the story goes, it's a, it's actually a parable for our times. Three women helped him make that business, including that college freshman. Uh, he got rid of all of them. And when he got rid of the college freshman, she said, but you're not going to get the market information. He said, I don't care. At which point they overproduced Beanie Babies, collapsed the market and went out of business. <laughs> but it's a true American story because he's worth three billion dollars. <laughs> and you might be interested in this. He owns the Four Seasons Manhattan, the New York City Four Seasons. and Just just the Manhattan one? Oh, he owns I that one that and one in Santa worked. Barbara. Yeah, the Four Seasons chain runs it, manages okay. it. But he won't let them reopen. He closed it in COVID and he won't let them reopen. It's too expensive. So it's... It's okay, I actually do really respect that of just owning a hotel, but not letting but anybody not <laughs> operate it, kind of just like a child in a large, empty house. Cartman land. Kind of yeah. Thing. He was Elon Musk before Elon Musk. I think we can say that. It's, a, it's actually, watch the movie, but then read the story, because there's more. He also, this is what made me think of it, was you know, all this time stashing money in a Swiss account so the IRS wouldn't see it. Ultimately, I think over $400 million in a Swiss account... They caught him, and they gave him two years probation. Felony tax evasion. He wow. pled guilty to rob a 7-Eleven, they'll kill you. But 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 steal $400 million from the IRS? No problem. He did pay $50 oh million in fines, and the judge said, your charitable works lets you off the hook. So that's what made me think of it. Uh, so they, he, so he legally can't watch NASA Plus. He is not allowed. To, that's that's how it comes full circle. He, yeah, I'm bringing it back. <laughs> yes, I wanted to say honestly, I wanted to say Ty Warner, but I realized no one would know what I was talking about. So I said Bernie Madoff, which isn't really a good one either. He's dead, so he's Bernie obviously Madoff, not watching know. NASA TV Plus. But Ty Warner, that was the real joke. Now that you've now and now right. you know now we're all here. The rest of the story. Uh, the end of the line on the Uber fatal car story. You may remember back in 2015, it was, the I think, the first fatality from a self-driving vehicle. And Uber uh, killed a woman in uh, Tempe, Arizona, who was crossing the street in the middle of the night, in the middle of the, st the street, by the way, not at an intersection, on her bicycle. The car hit her, killed her, and there was a lot of conversation at that time. Is it are these self-driving vehicles unsafe? Who gets blamed for a fatality in this case? The uh, mm -hmm. and there was a safe. Now here's the thing: there was a safety driver, and we found out uh, from telephone records that she'd been playing a game while this car was going down the street. In her defense, it was the middle of the night. There was no 
she, it wasn't easy to see. Had she even been driving, she might still have hit this person because she just came out of nowhere. Um, in any event, uh, this week she uh, pled guilty to a count of endangerment and was sentenced to three years of supervised pro probation. No time in prison. Um, mm. It's a plea deal, so there was no uh, no jury. She was she could have Does faced. Does the company face any sort of accountability in that? Well, sense? isn't that a good question? Or is it just her? Yeah. Uh, because of the plea bargain, Uber does not have to worry about uh, anything at this point. There was a, a lengthy investigation. Good investig for Uber. Good for Uber. It would be nice <laughs> if you were to plead guilty. <laughs> uh, you were in the car. Yeah. You know? uh, we weren't anywhere we near. We were it. nowhere near the vehicle at the time, as you may remember. The National Transportation uh, Safety Board did uh, have a lengthy investigation. Um, the uh, I'm not going to say her name, but the, the safety driver's legal team had shown every intention to make its defense sh about shifting blame to Uber, arguing that she had been set up to fail. Uh, and in the NTSB found that the car failed to identify Hertzberg, the woman killed, as a pedestrian. No brakes were applied, so the car just whizzed right through. Um, Uber according to the NTSB, also kept a, quote, inadequate safety culture, doing little to protect test operators from the well-known phenomenon, we all have it, of automation complacency. Uh, that's why she was playing a game. The car's doing great. I don't need to worry about it. Uh, in the months before the crash, Uber had removed a requirement for there to be two test drivers and test pilots in each car. Um, solo operators were often looping the same monotonous route on hours-long shifts, left to self-police their usage of cell phones. Sounds like Uber's a little bit at fault. Yeah, and I'm sure these people aren't getting paid much. Yeah. If it, like, yeah. you know. She, uh, Vasquez's, I'm sorry, I said her name. Well, I'll say it now. Vasquez's attorney contends she was only listening to the voice, <laughs> not playing a game, as operators are allowed to do. Uh, the investigators mixed up which phone Vasquez was looking at in the seconds leading up to the fatality. Uh, the defense attorney said in court, she was not watching the voice, Your Honor. She was doing what she was asked to do by Uber, and that is to monitor the systems in the car. Nevertheless, Judge, she's indicated the conduct itself was reckless. She acknowledges that and accepts responsibility. So, uh, I mean, it's a tragedy. Um, there's a person dead. We, at the time, kind of blamed Uber, but there was some question about the safety driver. Um, she's now basically bearing all the criminal blame. It would be interesting, though, like, I know, you know, and I understand why we're thinking that Uber might be, like, mainly at fault. But I do kind of wonder, like, what if she was actually just watching the road and just, like, messed up? Like, what if that were the case? Yeah, which happens and all the time, right? Yeah, and it's just hard to know in this case because I don't think that there was enough to figure out, you know, if she was playing a game or even if she was just watching the road and missed it or something. Uh, well, and let's face it, there are many, many vehicles now from Waymo, Cruise, and others uh, driving without safety drivers. All over San Francisco, all over Phoenix, all over Los Angeles. A any of you ever uh, driven in a... A self-driven car without... Uh, have you, Lou? I have. It's a little freaky. Yeah. Especially as a passenger in the back seat. You have to kind of trust that they're doing the right thing. Yeah, what are you going to do? Leap don't. to the front seat and grab the wheel? Exactly. Or jump out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, in a way, this, is, this, this, this conviction is kind of the ancient history of self-driving vehicles. We don't have yeah. test, you know, safety drivers anymore. Not, not often, anyway. All the cars in San Francisco, both from uh, Chevy's Cruise, GM's Cruise, and uh, Google's Waymo are unpiloted. They're empty. And so far, you know, there haven't been any fatalities that I know of. Maybe they're better at it. Tesla did, uh, and this story came out this week, create a secret team to suppress thousands of complaints about the driving range. Tesla, now this is in the early days of Tesla where they would... Uh, when you got in the car after charging up, predict a lengthy range of 300-some miles. Then you'd get in the car, 
And as you're driving, that number would start to plummet precipitously. Uh, and in fact, that was intentional. Tesla would give uh, an intentionally optimistic uh, range. And remember, in the early days of electric vehicles, there was real range anxiety, real concern. There maybe still is. It's still one of the things that makes it hard to sell an electric vehicle. Uh, but when you called Tesla to say, hey, what's going on? My range was 353 miles, and halfway through the ride, it went to 12. Um, Tesla had a team to take that call and say, no, no, there was nothing wrong. We're going to cancel your visit. The reason being a service visit costs about $1,000 for Tesla. And there was a lot of pressure on service centers, uh, long waits for appointments. And I do remember that. Uh, and because really there was nothing to fix, <laughs> all they'd be able to do is say, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's normal. Uh, the car realized you weren't going to get the mileage we thought you were. So we, we adjusted it. It is accurate by the time you get to run out of uh, uh, yeah, by the time it says zero, it's, it's right. And actually, uh, one of the things that the Reuters uh, story says is that Tesla did design their cars when it hit zero to have a buffer of about 15 miles so that you could get to a, a somewhere, a charger. Nice. So there was, a, so it would say zero prematurely as well. Um, the directive Ian isn't even that great. You know, that's especially if they're playing around with that to begin with. And then there's the 15. That's, Kind of worries. It's all over the place, right? The, this is from Reuters. The directive to present the optimistic range estimates came from Tesla chief executive Elon Musk, according to a source. Elon, quote, Elon wanted to show good range numbers when fully charged. When you buy a car off the lot seeing 350 mile, 400 mile range, it makes you feel good. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Look at this is Elon in when a nutshell. When you realize at home that the car you purchased does not have that range, <laughs> I you might feel less good. At you've great already expense, bought the car. when I bought the Model X, I bought the bioweapon defense mechanism. And it even had a bioweapon, you know, that logo with a scary logo. It was just a HEPA filter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, Wait, <laughs> really? You bought a bioweapon defense system? Again, man. So stupid. Um, yeah, because I thought, well... You are the target audience for this company, <laughs> <though>, Leo. <laughs> I also bought Ludicrous Mode, which I quickly uh, stopped using um, because it, all the blood would rush to my head and I would almost pass out. And that seemed kind of dangerous, you know, when you were excelling. What is Ludicrous Mode? <laughs> Ludicrous. <laughs> so another great... Look, at if nothing else, Elon used to be a great marketer. I don't know if you could say that today, but he was a great marketer. And uh, the you could buy a normal car or you could buy it with insane acceleration or you could buy it with ludic ludicrous acceleration. And this is a thousand, multi-thousand dollar, probably four thousand dollar upgrade. And all it meant was that instead of zero to 60 in six seconds, it would do zero to 60 in three seconds. Right. And all they and it's the same car, by the way. There's a knob. And they, they, where did you go to try this? Well, just out here. So people would <laughs> just just out and about. Yeah, people would. Someone. That's what these red light cameras are picking up. But they're like, this Leo dude is doing zero to sixty in three seconds. He's people, ludicrous. People would. People would come over, and I'd say, because this was, I bought a Tesla before it was widely available. You say, do you want to go ludicrous mode? People would say, how's the acceleration? I said, well. Well, let's go for a ride. And there's this pretty much a good straightaway here. It's about like, I don't know, a thousand foot straightaway. And the way you do ludicrous mode is you put your foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time all the way. What? <laughs> what? Is this Mario Kart? <laughs> That is how a child describes driving a car. <laughs> and, then, and then you say, hold on. And then you take your foot off the brake and you go, Whoo! and it really, there were a lot of videos at the time of people do, surprising. You don't want to surprise somebody with this because the coffee cups go flying. Stuff goes flying and backwards. There are a lot of videos of that. Um, but what I realized is this is probably dangerous because it would not only <laughs> pin my head against the the back like this but i would start to red out 
And I thought, I'm going 80 miles an hour down a thousand foot straight away into an intersection. I probably should not do this anymore. So this is what Yeah, happens. we have to retract all of our previous statements about <laughs> self-driving cars because clearly we're the problem. <laughs> that Uber was doing a cool 35. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, this is the bioweapon defense mode. See, it has this great logo, the, you know, the little <laughs> creepy logo. My God. Yeah. And it's just a HEPA filter. Literally. That's amazing. I love it. He was a good marketer. I kind of, in the back of my mind, I knew I was being a sucker. But I thought, this is part of the marketing. I'm supporting Elon's goal to uh, get uh, gas vehicles off the roads and to save our planet. And so I'm going to, I paid a ridiculous amount of money for this vehicle. And, but I'm, but I'm kind of subsidizing the next generation of Teslas, which will be affordable. And of course they weren't, but that was the theory, right? He was going to release a model three that would be 30,000 and everybody would buy it. And then everybody would be electrified. Leo, don't, don't these companies, they all have the same problem though. I look at the lightning from Ford or, you know, all of them claim they, they, they control the control of their experiments say, Hey, this car can go this far if you're in a control. But like they never, ever go that far. The same thing in like an analog to this is Internet speeds, right? You kind of get pay for something, but you never, ever get that speed. It's like there needs to be something that enforces this so that when you do get it, you have a little bit of trust. And I think that's the biggest problem. All of them are going to continue to do it if they're not forced to do it differently. This was uh, this is a um, uh, supercut of Tesla Model X super ludicrous mode rides. I'll I'm sorry, I just now, I want a version of this video, but with just you and different people <laughs> in your life. Wait. I think, uh, I think we have some fans who have those videos. I think Roberto, you made a video, didn't you, Roberto? I scared Roberto. He almost, uh, he almost had It was a heart actually, attack. I shot that video with Roberto, actually. I didn't get it. Were you in the car? I was in the car. I shot that with him. I didn't know. Benito, you were uh, with us. Wait a minute. No, no, no. And, and Gadget. And Gadget when Roberto, uh, Roberto Baldwin. Oh, did Roberto the, Baldwin. Did the yes. Tesla X. The yeah, so you've been in there. I did that one, yeah. See the, see the buttons that says, no, I want my mommy, or yes, bring it on. This guy, wow. brilliant marketing. Brilliant. Knew how to market like crazy. Let me see if I can find uh, the, the part where he steps on it here. It really scares you, actually. It's so fast. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Just, there's videos from the new Roadster that have this too. Oh, the Plaid. Pretty crazy. Yeah, the Plaid yeah. does that. Yeah, or the new Roadster. Yeah, yeah. No, he's still selling this crap. Yeah. And it just pins your head to the... It's fun though. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, moving moving right along. Did I say 3 billion meta users? That's how we got started with this. There are 3 billion meta users. Um, uh, good news. This is good news. Android is now going to warn you if there is a Bluetooth tracker coming uh, with you, not, not only an AirTag, but anybody's Bluetooth tracker. Uh, they mentioned this at Google I.O., but they're now starting to finally roll this out for Android. This was always a problem with AirTags. The iPhone would say, you know, there's an unknown AirTag near you. But Android phones wouldn't, you, you'd be easy to track somebody with an Android phone. Um, so the good news is uh, Android has now added that capability. It turned out Apple and Google uh, are working on this together. They uh, said uh, last May that they were going to draft an industry-wide specification specifically for, for safety, focusing on how users could be alerted to unwanted tracking from uh, Bluetooth devices. That's really good news, especially because yeah. they don't often work together. On yeah, sort of there's only a few things, but this one, I, you know, in the Steve Jobs era, he hated Google. He sued him. He thought Android was a ripoff. Um, but I think now the companies are a little more mature. Here's ex an example of what you'll see on an Android phone. It'll be an unknown tracker alert, tracker traveling with you. The owner of the tracker can see the location. Uh, and I think for people who are worried about a spouse trying to track them or, you know, somebody that met in a bar, this was a very important uh, thing to have. So it's good. Uh, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Except <laughs> the Google says the update is on hold. <clears throat> uh, the decision was made to wait to roll out these updates because Google is now working in partnership with Apple to finalize the joint unwanted tracker alert specification by year end. So, sorry about that. 
This is mainly targeted at the consumer ones, though, right, Leo? Because there are can, like other more commercial oh, ones that don't use Bluetooth. If you're willing to spend thirty bucks, you can put a GPS tracker underneath the fender, and you, you know, right. all bets are off. Yeah, this is those little tags. It's the tile. Right. Uh, this will apply to tile, Chipolo, and Air, Apple's Air Tags, uh, and other ones like that. Um, a little disappointing. Google had planned to do this by now. In fact, the, it's a little confusing because the story said they are doing it, and then. It says, Android will now warn you about unknown Bluetooth trackers. At the top, <laughs> at the bottom, it says, never mind, they're waiting till the end of the year. Is that right? I'm, I must be misunderstanding yeah, I guess that this. The, there must have been some update that happened right after I.O. <sighs> All right, I'm. This is very confusing. Seems like typical Google, though, right? Yeah, they, within the space of yeah. one article, they announced <laughs> something and killed it. It's a remarkable. By the way, Google had a very good quarter ad sales up 4.4% for YouTube. Alphabet handily topping earnings estimates. And the hatchet person, you, Google's uh, CFO, Ruth Porat, is being bumped upstairs. She's going to oversee investments for Google. She will uh, no longer be the chief financial officer. So if, if you're blaming her for all the things Google killed, you can, you know, she's she's moving up. She's getting her just reward. She's getting a better job. Actually, Microsoft had a good quarter, didn't it, Lou? Very good quarter. Yes, they did. Does yes, that... They, they were... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just wondering, you know, normally financials are more for the stock market. But it is important yeah. for companies like Microsoft and Google because of stock awards, right? To employees, it's how they part of the way they pay Absolutely. salaries. Yeah, yeah, we 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 get glued to the screen every day, every time they release these things. We don't know ahead of time, and I would say like we watch the day of. They kind of drop drastically because people don't know what's going on, and then they're doing well, and then two days later, we have some happy days. So yeah, it's, it's oh, good. that's so that was the question. Is so people do pay attention. Steve Jobs very famously did not want to go public with Apple because he did not want employees watching their their net worth every day on the on the screen little net worth trackers uh right and also because he we wanted to keep it all them. for himself but is that true is that what people do in yeah the, oh yeah absolutely we <laughs> uh, right. i mean especially yeah i mean you, like you said we get rewarded with stock awards every year and so those vest over five years and so you you kind of have to wonder what they're going to be worth when they do vest uh it's too early to say whether ai has contributed to the bottom line in fact if anything ai is costing at this point, although it didn't look like it costs uh, much. Um, yeah, they, they were I mean, able to make it it's up. It's kind of housed in their Microsoft cloud part of their revenue. So but you're, you're seeing, you know, almost 30 percent increases there. So, you know, I think that's the biggest thing. Obviously, Azure is kind of driving most of this. So as they say, a rising tide, uh, you know, lifts all boats. Um, and yeah, uh, even though I'm sure Azure spends a lot of money didn't they they said 10 billion dollars to to uh, open ai over a period of some years um most much of that i imagine was in uh, azure credits right. nevertheless azure is very very profitable at this point it's really a race between amazon and and uh and microsoft for the cloud aws is still bigger though right Yep, they're still bigger. It's a big, bigger in di especially different parts of the world. Uh, you know, obviously a little bit more growth in the in Europe and in Asia than than Microsoft. So there's still some room to, yeah. to grow. Yeah. Uh oh, the kids woke up. I hear them in the background. Maybe time for another Barbie infusion. Uh, let's see. You oh, good news. UPS and Teamsters have reached agreement. So the UPS news, strike yeah. has been averted. What is Amazon? Is Amazon? So this is always an issue for Amazon. I remember reading this in um, a couple of books about Amazon uh, that the costs of shipping were a big part of what's holding Amazon profits down. Is that right, Paris? Well, I mean, this has been kind of the uh, primary focus of Amazon. I feel like over the last decade has been building out different parts of its logistics network in order to bring those costs in-house and bring them down. Right. So, I mean, now when you order something from Amazon, it's coming from an Amazon fulfillment center where it's being stored, even if Amazon doesn't own the goods. That good is being, um, you know, packed, put on a, um, a truck that is probably operated by an Amazon 
third party contractor who's probably dragging an Amazon brand trailer and that'll go to, you know, a different sort center or kind of a delivery center that are all within this Amazon network using a bunch of different third party contractors um, that are within the Amazon bubble. So it's trying to lower its costs. I remember anecdotes in uh, Brad Stone's uh, second book about uh, Amazon, Amazon Unbound, about, you know, the, if, when, when they came up with the price for Amazon Prime, there was no idea of how much that's going to cost them. So they just made up a number and they've slowly raised that number. It's almost double what it cost initially. But nevertheless, despite that, it's still probably a money loser because it's so expensive oh, to do second day shipping. And so Amazon, Amazon plays hardball. They played hardball with American Express. I'm sorry, FedEx. <laughs> I confuse <laughs> Amex and FedEx. I don't know why. For the Federal Express, they played hardball with UPS. But I see when Amazon delivers, I see a lot more Amazon Prime trucks than I used to. Still, st still occasionally the Postal Service will deliver on Sunday. Uh, occasionally I'll see a, a FedEx or UPS truck. But I think Amazon really is taking it all over. Didn't they buy a fleet of yeah. jets? Yeah, I mean, Amazon owns most aspects of its transportation network, and that's kind of been its really big project, especially over the last five years. Interesting. It's bringing as much of that as it can in-house because, I mean, frankly, with what we were talking about with labor unions, they don't want to have to play ball with, you know, USPS, deal with – it was a big deal when they got USPS to even deliver for them on Sundays. They don't want to have to work with um, – these larger labor unions and organizations that are going to charge higher prices when Amazon, because Amazon is a very uh, kind of spiky demand organization. There will be some times where all of a sudden they need thousands of packages to be going out every hour from a certain delivery station versus, you know, there will be other times when they don't really need that many employees. So they need to be able to, I guess from a purely like Amazon's perspective, they need to be able to have a highly flexible workforce, which is going to involve a lot of third party contractors that they can pay as little as possible in order to make everything as efficient as possible for the business. It's, it's a fascinating business. It looks like initially Andy Jassy was not, uh, I felt like wasn't really, uh, he hadn't really found his, his saddle yet. He wasn't really, but now he feels like he's doing a very good job maintaining maybe better than Bezos did, uh, Amazon's supremacy. Would you agree? Is Jesse a good replacement for Jeff Bezos? Um, I mean, I think it's hard to say, obviously Bezos, I think was presiding over a very different Amazon Yeah, and, he had built up this network, the kind of leadership part of Amazon is called the S team, the senior leadership team. Um, and Bezos had provided, presided over a very different company than the one you are seeing now over the last year or two since Jesse has taken over the head of Amazon's fulfillment and like his Amazon's fulfillment and logistics czar was this guy, Dave Clark, who essentially had built Amazon's whole kind of uh, logistics apparatus from the ground up. He's gone. Many of his lieutenants are gone. Many of the other leaders in different parts of the business from uh, retail to parts of entertainment have left. Um, but obviously the business has a really strong foundation and has an insane amount of employees, even in its corporate um, ranks. And Jassy is now ruling that version of Amazon, which is going to be a very different company than the one we'd seen five years ago. Cause it's no longer exclusively about growth 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 it is about maintaining this giant beast yeah and maintaining it especially in one of the most difficult regulatory environments the company has ever seen what are what are the investigations amazon is under investigation from the ftc for for a variety of things um politico uh my old ex-colleague josh cisco actually had a really good uh scoop this week that the ftc is uh perhaps in the final stages of bringing its lawsuit against amazon on kind of a number of fronts they actually um, want to i think he says break up amazon or could break up amazon yeah i mean that is i think someone like lena khan's ultimate goal is they uh, my understanding of it is that the issues the regulatory that regulators have with Amazon. I mean, they're multifaceted, but they kind of all tie back to this concept of like a legal tying, um, essentially saying that, you know, you have this company that, um, I guess we'll take one example. 
if you are an Amazon seller in order to have like, let's say you're, you sell towels in order to have your towels show up on the first page of Amazon results. Um, when someone searches towels, you need to be able, you need to be using Amazon prime. You need to be paying for your stuff to be, uh, in the Amazon delivery uh, warehouse and also paying for Amazon to deliver that because that will make you show up in higher in rankings. They use the those Amazon recommendations and the, and the page to basically blackmail third party suppliers. Yeah. I mean, with ads, like what you're talking about in order, you have to pay for ads. You have to pay for sponsored recommendations and things like that in order to get in there. Do you and think the pink dumbbells paid to be in the top of my search or that Almost just... Almost certainly. <laughs> yeah. Those pink dumbbells, they have to play the game, Leo. And they also, I mean, part of this, they have to um, agree not to list their products for a lower price elsewhere. Yeah. Meanwhile, this is what Apple... they're paying extra for the logistics. They're paying yeah. extra for ads. And people like Khan say, you know, that is ultimately harming consumers. And part of how Amazon's been able to do all of this, like you said before, you know, have lower prices really build up this huge service is because they have things like AWS and different very profitable parts of the business that have allowed them to operate at a loss in various other parts of their business. So part of the impetus for perhaps moving towards a breakup would be that it would allow those parts of Amazon to compete more fairly with others. Even pink dumbbells have to play the game. And I think that that's the key. <laughs> that's true. Actually, it's really interesting because Amazon wants you to use Amazon fulfillment, not, not merely because they make money on it. They may not make money on it, but they get lots of information. And that's when you start to see your product duplicated by an Amazon basics product. Or, uh, you know, by and Amazon has dozens of fake company names that are really Amazon. And they'll they'll say, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, those sheets are selling really well. We ought to undercut the price and sell them ourselves. That kind of thing. It's it. It's so hard to untangle it. I mean, when you say something like break up Amazon, you're you're hitting at the foundation of American capitalism. I mean, clearly it's a problem. I mean, yeah, and Amazon's argument for, like, the argument from folks at Amazon would be that every company is doing this. You know, you look at a supermarket, you go to right. Trader Joe's, and it's right. Trader Joe's brand everything, and they copy all of the competitors. But I think that that is maybe what folks like Khan are getting at, is that Amazon seems like a good and meaty target to attack a part of capitalism that uh, well, at least this sect of the political elite have deemed, you know, has gone too far. And they're doing it at a scale far beyond, you know, even Walmart. We, uh, I mean, it's just a fascinating subject. You have a good, good beat and I uh, do a great job uh, on the information. We're going to wrap things up in just a second. I do want to play a little video that uh, I think Victor has worked so hard on. He's been really pretty much all week long, but putting together some of the highlights from this week on Twit. And I would be remiss if I did not play it for you right now. Watch. In studio with us, because he just gave his big lecture at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, Jeff Jarvis. It's so good to see it you. It is so good to be here. It really is. And, and I, I risked... <laughs> Craig, the gun. <laughs> Craig, Craig gets his plug no matter what. Previously on Twit. Tech News Weekly. It's me, Jason Howell, and I start off the show chatting with Kyle Kang from Nothing about the Nothing Phone 2. I think the goal is when you see a Nothing product, um, you know, it has a design philosophy and ID that, um, you know, that you can identify with. And it's been received positively. And the teenage guys and, and the team from London have, you know, I think have built a roof around design that's been really well responded to. Hands on Windows. We're going to take a look at command lines in Windows 11, specifically Command Prompt, and the slightly newer <laughs> Windows PowerShell. Club Twit exclusive. Today we're doing a fireside chat, not an AMA, which is slightly different, uh, with the host of This Week in Space, co host of This Week in Space, Mr. Rod Powell. Mr. Powell, how you be, sir? Good, how are you? I am unbelievable. I'm glad, I'm so glad you didn't greet me with one of those Star Trek wavy kinds of things because <laughs> you do come off as somewhat, somewhat normal now. The man who thinks that other men who throw around little bags of air for a living is more important than going into space starts <laughs> off with insults <laughs> right up front. Twit. I expected no less. Thank you, my friend. I'm calling it little bags of air from now on. That's it. 
We had a great week on Twitter. I hope you watch. I hope you join Club Twit, and uh, we will have some great people uh, coming up uh, on Twit and uh, many of our other shows uh, soon. Uh, final words in just a bit. Uh, let's see. Oh, I did want to mention Paris did a great story about something I'd never heard of. It was your weekend You've never piece. heard of blind? I'd never heard of blind. And now I'm worried that my employees are living. Have you ever heard of blind? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, you have, Lou. Big time. Yeah. Big time. So what is, yep. what, so what is blind? So, I mean, I'll, I'll let Paris uh, talk about it more in depth, but I can tell you anything that happens at, at a Microsoft or a Google or, or whatever, people get on there and they, they voice their... You know, they're, they're issues with and it. And you're doing it anonymously, it anonymously, right? They can't yeah, tell yeah. you're doing it. Uh, like, Well, I mean, they have your email address. Yeah. So they could technically like relate you back to a username, but they don't supposedly don't tell the company. Tech so people are smart enough. Say whatever you want. They could anonymize. I would imagine they could anonymize it. It's Paris writes. Yeah, I mean, so those who are like out of the loop. Go ahead. The blind app, I think we should just explain what it is for if anybody's yes. listening. It's essentially an anonymous workplace social media app where you know there are no uh, names but everybody on there has to sign up with a company email address oh. and post and comment so you know you'll see something from a username it's just like xyz123 but they say Amazon next to it. And that means they're oh. a verified current Amazon employee who signed up using their Amazon email and then People will use this to talk about kind of tech news, anything related to work. But you also then have kind of these internal company channels where Amazon employees can talk to Amazon employees. And so it's been a great source of like leaks and interesting tech news, because if you see a post from somebody who's a verified Amazon employee saying, hey, don't know, don't ask me how I know, but layoffs are coming next week you might pay attention more than just some Yahoo on Reddit. And it, it's pretty difficult to, to tease out sometimes the parody and the trolling accounts too. So like people oh, yeah. start it's a real these wild terrible West. conversations about people internally sometimes that you're like, wow, that's not real. So yeah, it's just tough sometimes. Paris writes, blind has become something like a Reddit for workplaces, mixing anonymous nastiness with layoff leaks, confessions about compensation and a bonanza of corporate gossip. Oh, this sounds juicy. Can I just go and read it or do you have to have... You can, yeah. Anybody can go and read it. You can sign up with a personal email and uh, you can just read whatever you want. You can also just look at it on uh, the web browser without signing in. You could use your Twit email though, Leo, and make up make an account. <laughs> I'm going to do a parody account. <laughs> and I mean, the thing is, there is, you know, precedent. A lot of CEOs and founders, the reason why I ended up doing this article is because this is a really popular app among, you know, tech workers and people in Silicon Valley. But a lot of what they're talking about are the sort of things that would piss bosses off. And yeah. I started to hear that, you know, CEOs and founders absolutely hate blind. I mean, it's like all something a lot of them talk about all the time. Well, the I worst thing you can to do from the point of view of the boss is reveal how much you make. Bosses hate that. You're legally protected. Yes. You can do that. It's not illegal. Bosses will lie to you. They'll say, oh, no, we keep this secret. This could be a there's not where no retaliation is allowed. But they do not want you to do that because then everybody has a better negotiating position. Uh, because you know how much I know how much Jammer B's making. I want to make more if I'm running the board, right? So and that's one of the real reasons why Blind has taken off is because I mean, one of the primary uses outside of kind of gossip is people coming to Blind being like, "Hey, I got this offer from Google. Here is you know my experience. Here is the salary. Here's the comp, like equity package and things like that. I have an offer from let's say like Microsoft, also one from Uber. Here's what I've got. What do you guys think I should do? How should I negotiate? And people will get in there with very specific advice and examples. You, um, you will find it interesting. A lot of the templates for just normal posts include TC. You'll see TC around there, which is total comp, and people just put that in there as like their their like the bottom part of their post. So they could be talking about oh, the lunchroom wow. and then just yeah. put TC, their level and what they're making. Oh, and that's my. like just what they do by default. That's table stakes. Wow. Yep. It mm -hmm. became, you're right, it became well known. And I, somebody, some of you may remember this when a uh, career, Korean Air uh, Lines uh, vice president 
lost it on a flight uh, to Seoul. This is back in 2014. Uh, she was served macadamia nuts in a paper bag rather than on a plate. <laughs> she actually forced the plane to return back to the gate. But the, then a post by an employee resulted in global media coverage. And she ultimately got a year in jail for yeah. saying, where is my plate? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out you can't really make a plane uh, go back wow. um, to the gate just because of over macadamia nuts without having some people get involved. I will say as a f company founder and principal, I believe, I think this is great. I think people, uh, you know, it benefits employees. Uh, it's too bad that you have to sift through some of the stuff to know whether it's real or not. Is it pretty obvious uh, Lou, when you read something that oh, some of them is, are, some yeah. of them are, people usually come to aid. So they'll say, this is not true. This is a troll or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, most people will kind of jump on that, but it's, it's sometimes pretty difficult. Look like at these. When, some, when the layoffs happen, you know, recently, you know, people always ask, what's the reason for the layoffs? And sure. There's really, you know, most people don't know um, they're, you know, they could be performance related or budget related or whatever, and they'll go in there and speculate, but say it's like fact and then people don't know. So it's, it's tough. This is the, uh, from Paris's article at the information, this is the poster blind posted in 2015 oh, yeah. around the, you remember this around the campus? Oh, yeah. Mini oh, yeah. Microsoft 2.0, talk to your coworkers anonymously. And then uh, on a phone screen, it says, okay, I think I just got promoted. My comp only went up 8%. Is this right? And then a poll, no, you got screwed. <laughs> yes, this is normal. It depends. And then search for blind in the App Store or Google Play. This ad not affiliated nor endorsed by Microsoft, like Yammer, which, of course, was the big acquisition of uh, 2015. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's wow. so funny because Microsoft was one of the first companies where Blind ever really took off. And they got it to take off by um, making these posters, which reference this thing called Mini Microsoft, a really yep. popular anonymous blog in uh, the mid-aughts. And the two founders snuck into Microsoft's campus uh, in the dark of night. Oh one God. of them drove the other one who was skinnier and faster, sprinted out and slapped them on different uh, things before security guards could catch them. And it helped their app. Well, yeah, take off. I love this. Uber, after Susan Fowler's famous blog post about sexual harassment, the company banned Blind in 2017... Tesla and others have gone a step further and blocked inbound account verification emails from Blind. Oh, that's clever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, to stop employees from signing up. Wow. What a story. That makes sense. Yeah. That actually makes sense. Yeah. Like companies don't want it, right? Yeah. It makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. I asked the uh, founders about this and they were like, actually, we don't really worry about it too much. It's been a thing ever since we were in Korea. It's very easy to get around email blocks. We can just make other emails Ooh. and do other things. But he's like, it actually benefits us because when this happens, it's the Streisand effect, you know? Yep. People yeah. start asking, what's blind? I hadn't heard of this. Why are yep. they blocking it? And look them up and download it and people end up talking. You can't really... Um, they had originally decided to make the app because there had been, a, it's a South Korean company, and um, one of the co-founders had worked for the Korean search giant Naver, which had had a, its own short-lived anonymous employee forum um, that really took off among employees, and then the company shut it down once they started getting too frank and talking about you know, the sort of things bosses don't like you to talk about, like compensation and whatnot. So from the beginning, they've been like, we know companies aren't going to like this, but we've got to find a way to give workers a voice. There's a long tradition of this. I mean, there, uh, there been, there was, remember Yak that was really caused problems in high schools. It was and secret secret. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, both yeah, of which I mean, gone so away. Blind came to the U S right as all of these anonymous apps had really taken off and gotten a, a uh, bad rap for just being anonymous toxic toxic cesspools. Yeah. And I think the thing that set blind apart was it's tied to work. There is some level of verification. Yik Yak's still around. I didn't don't. realize that. I think secret really? I think secret went away, right? Yeah, secret died like sixteen months after launching. Yeah. Oh wow. Because it was well, frankly, it was a real problem. I note though yeah. that on the Yak webpage, find your herd on Yik Yak anonymously collect with it, connect with anybody at your college. So they're pushing it more at college level. And 
There are at the links at the bottom. There's jobs, privacy, terms, and law enforcement. <laughs> mm. So clearly, I mean, this is one of the issues: is that some of the some of the traffic on these sites was really uh, action yeah. was uh, completely inappropriate. Um, good. Well, I'm. I hope Blind uh, does well and continues to do well. I think that's a great thing, and I'm so glad you are doing so well at the information. It is. It is worth subscribing for Paris Martineau alone. Uh, but I get so much great stuff. You, you, a lot of scoops. Um, I love the weekend uh, edition. Just some, just some really good stuff. Yanko works there now. He's just did a thing on exploding kittens. Uh, Jessica Lesson is always interesting and provocative. Um, I, I'm glad yeah, to put it in a plug for the take information. Take a fun deep dive. Go read the comments on my blind story. People are oh. up in arms. There's 15 of them, you know. Oh, uh, oh, I think like, the blind founders got in there at some point. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, I love it. Yeah. You have to, the commenting on uh, and the information is great because you cut, it's, it's, it's a process. It almost feels like you have to be approved. Like it's very high level commenters. It's I guess, tied to your subscriber account. Right. So if you comment, you have to comment with your name as a real which person makes it very interesting yeah yeah i've made comments on, on i've made comment once i think on the information and I, it was a great conversation that resulted uh, out of it so yeah it's yeah. a lot of ceos being like blind attracts whiners and haters <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's only the negative people you never hear from the happy employees on blind people aren't being like i love my boss for giving me a job <laughs> he's great my favorite Big comment Kenneth Goldman says, going to the app now. <laughs> and that was the big fear. That's exactly what they're saying. Good job, Paris Martineau. So great to see you. Thank you for being here. Come back again soon. We, I just love having you on. Very smart, very interesting. Always happy yeah. to be here. Anybody who has read even a part of the Robert Moses biography is a star in my book. Thank you so much. <laughs> Lou, you are the greatest, too. This Week in Enterprise Tech, every week on this network. If it weren't for Lou Maresca, there would be no Twyatt. I got to say, you helm that uh, show. You've got great co-hosts like uh, Chebert and Franklin. So, but but honestly, uh, when uh, Father Robert left and you came on board, uh, that's when I knew the show would survive because you keep well, it, thank you. You keep it going. That. Keep up the good work at Microsoft, too. I really appreciate it. Uh, you, you mostly work on Office, yeah? I do. I work on, on Office, and uh, I get to work on the Excel team and Office platform team, nice. which is like basically extending Office. So nice, fun stuff. Yeah, I'm very excited about Copilot coming to Office. Yeah, so are we. Yeah, so are we. fascinating. I didn't get to talk about AI with you at all, but I bet you you'll be talking a little bit about it on Twilight. So we always, took a always. we took an AI break this week. Uh, <laughs> we did. We had an AI guy on this week. We had a co-founder yeah. of Erudite. He's the AI for HR, so it's pretty interesting. Stuff. Yeah, it's really interesting what's going on. Shoshana, 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 I just love having you on. I want to get you on more, too. Shoshana Weissman is head of digital media, rstreet.org. What are you working on uh, these days, Shoshana? Um, a lot of uh, automation, a uh, lot of little automation things, but it's been a lot of fun just figuring out how I can cut down on the amount of burnout on my team so we can do more fun stuff. And we're doing a big email overhaul. And then I'm writing a kids online policy series that uh, is stressful because there's a lot of constitutional and like functional problems with kids online bills. So that's the fun in my life now. <laughs> you know, we didn't even get to that. And that is a big topic. I really wanted to talk about the kids online bill. They're kind of bringing back COPPA. Uh, yeah. and, and, and the real concern there is with age verification. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, if you have to say what age you are before you use a website, it doesn't just apply to 13-year-olds. It applies to everybody. And there are real privacy concerns with that. Uh, yeah, good. F keep fighting the good fight on that one. That's a Thank you so much. problematic bill. We'll t you know what? We should get you back to talk more about that. Uh, that's sure, a, I'm that's glad a, to. Is it, what is the prospect for that bill? Um, so there's a bunch of them. I ended up writing 12,000 words on it. I had started thinking I was going to write 2,000 because, and then I'm like, oh crap, it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. And I kept finding new issues with it. But COSA just passed um, judiciary and it'll probably get through Senate and in house more than likely. It's just very frustrating because um, I don't think lawmakers understand the real implications of what 
accurate age verification or burden on platforms to verify age means that if you're putting the burden on them, they have to do it. And that if they have to do it, it means face scans and government IDs. And that puts a lot of vulnerable people and just normal people who don't want their business everywhere at risk. Shoshana Weissman, muckrack. There you are, muckrack.com. Shoshana Weissman, if you want to follow all of this stuff, you write everywhere. I see you in Reason. I see you in uh, National Review, of course, at rstreet.org. Um, you're keeping busy. Thank you. Yeah. I yeah, love stuff. I, I need to chill out. <laughs> where, is, where is the COSA article? Um, so uh, that's all at rstreet.org. Okay. Most of my kids online stuff is there. There's one piece in Tech Dirt talking about how if it wasn't for me being on social media as a teenager, I wouldn't have the career I have. And I also wouldn't know I have fibromyalgia. I really loved that piece. I did read that piece. That was really, oh, thank you. really good. And, uh, and, and hit home, I think. Um, thank Mike, you so Mike, much. Mike's going to be on Twit soon. We, we love Tech Dirt and I read it religiously along with all of the other Mike's places. The yeah. That you, uh, you write and rstreet.org, of course. Thank you, Shoshana. Thank you so much, Lou. Thank you, Paris. Thanks to all of you who joined us today, especially you Club Twit members. We do Twit Sundays uh, about 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2100 UTC. I say the time so you can watch it if you want live. That's the, you know, as we make the show, uh, the live stream, 24 hours a day is live.twit.tv. You can get audio or video there. In fact, we just added Kick. Uh, another video uh, provider. So we have a number of different ways you can watch. All the links are at uh, live .tv. Uh If you are watching live, chat live. Uh, that's why we have a chat room, an IRC, because for years, more than 20 years, I've had a chat room going while I'm doing shows. IRC.twit.tv. It's kind of the back channel uh, to the show. Of course, there's also a Discord for Club Twit members. We invite you to join us either of those places. Uh, after the fact, there are discussions going on at our Mastodon instance, which is twit.social. That's open to all Twit listeners. All you have to do is say, I, I listened to the show or Leo sent me or something like that, and, uh, and I'll add you. Uh, it's a good conversation always going on there. And uh, if you prefer forums, we have a wonderful discourse forum uh, at twit.community, also open to all. But as I'm... I do with Twitch Social. I have to approve every account, only to keep spammers out. That's the main uh, point of all that. But a good place to uh, leave your comments about this show or any of the shows we do or any subject uh, on your mind. Uh, you can also get the show on demand. There are a few places to go. Of course, our website is the first place to start, twit.tv. Just look for This Week in Tech. There's a YouTube channel called This Week in Tech that's got all the shows you can also subscribe in your favorite podcast player. In fact, that's the best thing to do. If you subscribe, you'll get it automatically the minute we've done editing it. And that guarantees you'll have it in time for your Monday morning commute. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I think I think it's safe to say the longest-running uh, tech podcast in the world. Certainly one of them. Yeah, right? In our 18th year. Uh, and for 18 years, I've been saying it. And I'll say it again. Another twit is in the can. Thanks for this. Amazing.